All right, good morning. We're going to get started this morning with an invocation from Reverend Adam Shahan at Wesley OKC United Methodist Church, uh, and that'll be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman Todd Stone. Please stand. Let's pray. New every morning is your love, holy and gracious God, and your care for all that you have created. We've gathered to begin the day's work for which we were chosen and set aside. In this moment, I give you thanks for our mayor and our city manager, the members of this council. I give you thanks for the staff, the volunteers, and all those paid and unpaid who help enact and support decisions that are made in this room. As they lead today, grant them your guidance and discernment that what is said and done would be pleasing to you. For the refugees that are making new lives here, for the businesses putting down roots here, for our brothers and sisters struggling with housing or making ends meet, for those that have been told intentionally or unintentionally that they are not important or that they were not made in your image and called very good, turn our attention to them. Give us the strength to act on what we lift to you in prayer. I also give you thanks for this city and its people, for the change and development we've experienced, for new and continuing projects geared toward growth, the recruitment and retention, and especially those programs and services aimed at elevating the least who are in our midst. We have prayers of thanks and prayers for courage. May we do what is right even when what is right is not as easy. And may we measure our strength by the one among us who feels most vulnerable. Bless all those we have named God, as well as those unnamed that we're considering now in our hearts. You know our needs before we ask, and we acknowledge that you are often more ready to hear than we are to pray. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. Gear our attitudes, thoughts, and behaviors toward your will for the leadership of our city and the growth of your beloved community here on the earth. Amen. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. And we have a few items under item three, Office of the Mayor, uh, including a proclamation. So I'll make my way to the front to handle those. Why don't we get our transit folks? I think that's a not insignificant number of people in the room. Where? Just yeah, yeah. Everybody, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, everybody, get up here. All right, well, we are here today to honor Public Transit Professional Appreciation Day, which is actually coming up on March 18th, but we wanted to have lots of notice so we could show lots of appreciation. And so I would ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas public transit benefits all in central Oklahoma by reducing traffic and parking congestion, improving air quality, and making our city more equitable and accessible to all. And whereas Embark public transit professionals manage a fleet of vehicles each day, maintain on-time route performance, collect fares, assist residents in understanding and using the transit system, and play an integral role in economic development and driving the community of Oklahoma City forward. And whereas the duty of Embark bus operator is to safely maneuver transit vehicles through unpredictable traffic, tough weather conditions, and very tight spaces, while exercising caution and following the laws of the road to maximize the safety of their passengers and serving as upstanding examples of safety, courtesy, discipline, and effective communication as they perform their duties each day. And whereas Embark Fleet Maintenance staff provide expertise in the cleanliness, preventive maintenance, and upkeep of a fleet of buses, vans, and shuttles for the safety of customers, visitors, and the community, and whereas Embark facilitates and maintenance staff provide for the preservation and cleanliness of bus stops, the transit center, and public transit facilities in the heat of the Oklahoma summer, 
and during the bitter cold of a winter storm. And whereas Embark support staff provide excellence in customer service, dispatch and ensure the integral role of public transit to the transportation needs of residents and visitors to the neighborhoods and districts of the city. And whereas Embark public transit vehicles travel nearly 3 million miles and facilitate 3 million passenger trips annually in the greater Oklahoma City area. Now therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim March 18th, 2022 to be Public Transit Professional Appreciation Day in Oklahoma City. Thank you, Amy. Our public transit professionals have hard jobs, as it was stated here. You know, that's three million miles, you're operating a vehicle, and three million passengers. So you are also expected to have a high level of customer service and, uh, and to interact well with the people of Oklahoma City. So it's a lot on, on your team's shoulders, Jason, but we are very, very grateful, and that's why we were uh, more than happy to, uh, to do this today. Uh, we'd love for you to say a few words, uh, and obviously we're also joined here from many members of your team. Well, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. Um, as mentioned, uh, March 18th is uh, National Transit Professional Day, and so um, to have the Council consider this proclamation to bring that home locally is, um, I know, extra special to um, everybody on our team. Um, in case you're, you're curious about uh, the staff that's here today, um, these are the Embark uh, legends, and uh, our legendary employees are those that uh, have been selected by management and peers uh, within the department as best exhibiting our core values of being safe, being open, uh, being there, and being kind. So again, uh, appreciate uh, them joining us this morning. Excellent. Let's hear it for our public transit professionals. All right, why don't we get uh, Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller up here. We've had you on the agenda a couple times. We've deferred you twice, so uh, we're glad you could, you could be here this morning to join us. Uh, and of course, you are the police officers of the year, and so we would love to learn a little bit more about you, and I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Inspector William Lord and Inspector Chris Miller work in the police department. And whereas Inspector Lord works in the cold case unit and has been a city employee for 29 years, and Inspector Miller works in the cold case unit and, and has been a city employee for 29 years. And whereas Inspector Lord, Lord and Inspector Miller review cold cases and assess them for solvabil solvability in the Oklahoma City Police Department. And whereas Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller are responsible for investigating unsolved homicide cases that are at least a year old. And whereas Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller took over an unsolved investigation that took place in 2015 involving a child. And whereas Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller took control over the case and were able to solve it after four months of persistent investigation. And whereas Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller have shown extreme dedication in the cold case unit and have re-examined 78 cases which have led to further investigation. And whereas the council desires to recognize Inspector Lord and Inspector Miller for their dedication, professionalism, and commitment to the residents of the city of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Inspector William Lord and Inspector Chris Miller, 2021 South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club Police Officers of the Year. Well, thank you very much. This is a resolution, so why don't we go ahead and uh, pass it. So let's see if we can get a motion and a second. Cast your votes, I would like to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Well, we are so grateful for your service, and uh, you know this was very interesting to hear the kind of work you do. I know that's very meaningful, uh, obviously, to the probably very much so to the families of the victims uh, who have found themselves in that situation. Inspector Miller, you were uh, uh, voluntold to say a few words uh, this morning when we were <laughs> when we were deciding who would be the spokesperson for this duo. So, uh, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to hear a few words from you. You can always get on my partner for. For those kind of things. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, it's an honor to work uh, in the cold case unit. 
Um, as you might imagine, it's very challenging. There's, there are cold cases, uh, but it's also very rewarding when you're able to solve one. Um, one of the guys that's in our unit, a very important part, he's been in here, been in the unit for quite a while, is Mike Burke. He's a retired homicide detective at Oklahoma City, and he's been with the DA's office as investigator. He's ever a bit of a part as, as Bill and I. In fact, he kind of showed us the ropes when we, when we went in there. But I'm very thankful for Chief Gorley, the whole command staff, Clifton, Major, or Chief Clifton, Major Matthews, Captain French, everyone, for allowing us to go in there and be a part of really important work. Having said all that, could have been any number of uh, Oklahoma City police officers up here getting this today. Very, very proud of our organization and all the guys that we, and women that we work with. And thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for the inspectors. Finally, Lauren Thacker, come on down. You're the next contestant. <laughs> All right, well, Lauren Thacker is our Teacher of the Month, and we would love to learn a little bit more about you, Lauren, and so I will ask the clerk to please read this resolution. Whereas Lauren Thacker has been named Teacher of the Month for March 2022 by Mustang Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. And whereas Lauren was also named Mustang Public Schools 2020-2021 District Teacher of the Year. And whereas Lauren teaches English 4, Creative Writing, and Reach, a mentorship class at Mustang High School. And whereas Lauren graduated in 2005 from the John Cooper School in Texas before venturing to Oklahoma State University. While at OSU, she earned a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature in 2009 and a Master of Business Administration in 2011. And whereas Lauren began her teaching career in 2011 as a substitute teacher for Union Public Schools in Tulsa before being hired by Mustang Public Schools in 2012. And whereas Lauren continually encourages her students to achieve high academic standards while also creating lasting relationships and a rapport within the classroom. She strives to make her classroom a space where students feel comfortable, welcomed, and engaged. And whereas education is most definitely Lauren's calling, she works daily to challenge those around her, not only professionally, but as individuals. She reminds us all to laugh, enjoy ourselves, and create lasting relationships with those around us. And whereas Lauren loves reading dogs, attending Scottish festivals, going to Disneyland, traveling, eating exotic, exotic foods, and spending time with her family. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Lauren Thacker on her selection as the March 2022 Teacher of the Month by Mustang Public Schools and Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Thank you. And this is a resolution, so we're going to see if we can get a motion and a second for this. All right. Cast your votes. I wish to vote aye. Passes unanimously. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for all you do for the kids of our community. And uh, this was great to learn a little bit more about you. You have a lot of hobbies. I mean, that sounds like uh, a lot of stuff you do. Um, but uh, we're so very grateful. And obviously, you are well thought of uh, becoming the district teacher of the year as well. We'd love to hear a few words from you. Uh, you're an English teacher. Uh, I'm the son of an English teacher. So I know that uh, words are. Uh, not at a premium, so uh, feel free to have the floor. <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Mayor Holt and the City Council for this great honor. I appreciate it very much. Um, it is an honor for me to work in this city and in this state in public education. And um, any support that public education can get from the community, Oklahoma City is much, much, much appreciated. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. We can... <laughs> We continue to improve public education in this city, in the state. Um, we're rising in the ranks, and um, we just need all the help that we can get to do that. And I hope that collectively, in the next coming years, we can continue to make decisions that are best for Oklahoma kids. And 
I hope, as you can see, I have my own Oklahoma kid cooking right now, and so I see it from a very different perspective. This is my first than I have even as a teacher, and so um, there's, a, there's a lot at stake, and I continue to ask that everybody please help us in improving the state of education and making it even stronger for our kids. So thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for Lauren. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more item on Office of the Mayor, and that's item 3C, uh, two appointments to the Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, which we can handle if there's a motion. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, moving on to item four, items from council. There are none today. Which brings us to item five, city manager reports. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, we've got Mike Kanaf <coughs> with the uh, Riversport Foundation to provide a presentation on a quarterly report and update on the Riversport Foundation. With the Riversport. Um, well, we have a lot in store for 2022. Um, already we've had a lot of things going on. We're gonna give you a really quick report on, um, on kind of what our, what our projects currently are. And the first thing is the budget. And, and just a quick overview, just for those of you who may, maybe have not seen this yet, 34% of our revenue budgets are, are venture passes and sales. So that's, you can see the importance of that. And, Consequently, on the expense side, payroll is 55%. Those two go hand in hand because one of the issues we've currently had, we've had as well as so many others, are staffing, and that's a big focus for this coming year because that is really important. And also, past sales uh, last year, just give you a perspective. Things were up last year, which is good. We we forecast uh, and continued increase uh, for the, this coming year. Again, that's tied to staffing, but we feel really good about that as we move into. Uh, and then I wanted to share also, what you see here is a homologation report. What that is, is a report from the International Federation. Uh, they came in last year and did a, a complete analysis of our Whitewater Center. Then they gave me the report and the idea, and what they shared with me is number one, it's a really great report. And we have um, among, if not the finest, and this is according to the International Canoe Federation, artificial whitewater venues in the world which then leads us to an opportunity to have major events like world championships and world cups. And so there's certain things we need to do adjustment wise to, to be able to have those events along with, and so this number with deferred maintenance and capital improvements, it's not just the Whitewater, it's really the whole Boathouse District. It's something we continue to keep track of. We have a major world-class, very unique, distinctive venue. We wanna keep it uh, at, that, at that level. So. That, that, what, that's what that represents. I wanted to share this publicity and reach. Um, you may not watch Dude Perfect on YouTube, but I know a lot of kids do, and we've had over 11 and a half million views of our Whitewater Center from an episode that they filmed in October. Last night, some of you may be Bachelor fans, we were on The Bachelor uh, with, our, with our adventure venue, um, which is really exciting. And, um, and then the far, furthest to the right is we had an internationally televised event with the Super Cup last year. You know, I pulled that slide and I realized later that if you look at who was number one in the women's final was uh, a young lady from U the Ukraine. And uh, it does represent our international footprint and of course our hearts are going out to them right now. But um, last week we had Arshe Cooper here and uh, that was, Arshe was the subject of a documentary that's on Amazon Prime, A Most Beautiful Thing. It's also a book. He came and, and, what he, and he talked to the community, uh, the Rotary, several schools, and uh, our community at the river. His message is one of diversity and inclusion, and I would just emphasize that I really see you know, the, the fact that rowing is really epitomizes one OKC, people of all different backgrounds uh, coming together, and the only way you're gonna move is to row as one, and that's his message. And we had over 100 kids sign up from Douglas High School and FD Moon to start rowing. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, 
World-class events, um, we, we had our share last year, but it's only going to get more as we continue on into, into the future, and this year in particular. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. One of those is the Swift Water Championship. We're one of the premier venues for Swift Water Rescue Training in America. That's now going to come with a major event that we're partnering with Red Bull on. That will be in uh, late August. They'll bring first responders from all across America to Oklahoma City to compete and also to uh, train. So that will be coming up later this year. We're bringing back our corporate leagues, our corporate dragon boat, rowing and rafting. It brings the community to get together at the river. And then also bringing back all of our, if you go to the next slide, youth leagues. And so we have kids from multiple schools from across uh, Oklahoma City. They're, they're back on the water this week. And um, really exciting to see these kids who never would have thought they'd have this opportunity and actually be able to put, position themselves potentially for college scholarships. And so. Uh, these kids are, are starting out and uh, have some races up this coming up this spring. Thrive Outside is something that we were chosen, one of four cities in America, to, by the Outdoor Foundation to advance this initiative. Just a, a high point here I want to mention, we have had over 4,200 children that have come through our Thrive Outside program. That means repeated programming with these kids. The idea is we're changing culture and, and infusing more of an outdoor culture, health, and out, health culture among these youth. Uh, and we're going to work on an adventure therapy program this year as a, as a new addition. River Protectors is another major initiative that we launched last year. If you go to the next slide, it was something that we actually won with OKC Beautiful, the oh, Keep Oklahoma Beautiful Be uh, Visionary Award. It really emphasizes that people are taking ownership of our river and, and let's learn how to protect it and, and really uh, engage the whole community in this effort. So. The new program this year is Compass Rose Leadership. I just wanted to share this. It's a partnership between us, Leadership Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma City University. It's about developing a, a leadership curriculum for our corporate leaders, our business leaders, and also youth. And this is going to happen at our new Whitewater Center Conference Center at, the, in, in, at River Sport, as well as on the water, working, to, like I said earlier, as one in, in a rowing shell. Uh, Winter engagement. Uh, this is new. If you've not been down there, you may have not noticed we've got a, a new structure up and we had what we called Nordic adventures with indoor, some ice skating, indoor uh, climbing and a variety of things throughout the winter. We have that second picture is of our new second floor of the Whitewater facility. We had a big indoor rowing championship and then on the right side you look out and there's people skiing, in, which goes to the next slide. Um, Ski OKC has been a big hit. This is a partnership with us and in as much foundation. It's inside the Whitewater Center. We've had so many people bring their kids out, learn to ski and snowboard, and then go off to Colorado. And, or some kids just coming to learn to do something that they never thought they'd get to do in Oklahoma City. So it's been very well received and, and it just kind of continues with our formula and just getting people active. So. Barquet is our major capital project going on. This is a shot taken a few weeks ago of that site, two acre site, and it is uh, well underway. And then we also have a bike park project that is gonna occur through a $300,000 grant we, re we received from uh, the Trails, found, trail, uh, Trails Grant. And then we open March uh, 12th uh, through spring break. So I encourage you to come out and encourage others to come out. And then this is a kind of list of some major events we have coming up. I will note on March 19th through 20th, the Freestyle Kayak Team Trials. This is where they're doing flips and tricks in the, in the white water. It's quite a thing to watch. That'll happen here in just a couple weeks. And then we have a Pan American Solemn Championship in May. A lot of big things happening already this year. And then as going back to what I said at the beginning, now hiring, this is critical for us. Um, one of the issues we had last year is just getting enough raft guides. We couldn't be at capacity. And so this is something we're really focusing on for this year. So we're, something for everyone. We, we, we're really working with kids from across the community to get engaged. So uh, we encourage you to help us spread that word as well. So thank you very much. And if there's any questions. Any questions for Mike? I don't, I don't necessarily have any questions, but um, sitting on the, the finance committee, it is enlightening to see just the, the changes, those small things that can take place for us to be able to get uh, to a place where now we see uh, the memberships as far as those seasonal passes out, just outnumbering uh, each year and also many people of different backgrounds being able to now enjoy the river sport and the outdoors in a way that a lot of people have not been able to experience it before. 
So I just want to give my gratitude to you all for uh, accepting the feedback uh, from a lot of us that have said, what about, you know, and, and being able to embrace those conversations. And um, for the, those who are not familiar with Arshay Cooper, the gentleman that you saw in that diversity and inclusion slide, there's a documentary, as he talked about, a most beautiful thing, and it is narrated by Common, the, the hip hop artist Common. So he was here, and unfortunately, the day that he was supposed to go out and talk to some other students, the, I don't know what we're calling that, that Armageddon ice <laughs> storm came and just took over. So, but he has promised that he will be here in the spring. So we're excited about his commitment to being here. And I also want to show off FD Moon Middle School because we had some improvements done to that school. And as you can see, the children are enjoying it. And it's for occasions just like this for Arshay Cooper to be able to come and tell his story uh, to the youth. And his story was amazing. So um, I'm just excited again and looking forward to, to understanding how we can further help expand this. And kudos to you all in the team for all that you are doing because I know we've had some very tough conversations to get us to where we are today. But I'm glad we're here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for everything. So we have a few other reports that are on today. One is the Council Priority Update Performance Report on promoting a safe, secure, and thriving neighborhoods. And then um, we also have the uh, Revenue Enforcement Report. And I just wanted to point out in this one, it's actually managed by our Treasury Division of the Finance Department. I appreciate the work that they do. It grew out of an audit that was done through the City Auditor's Office under Jim Williamson's leadership and really has helped us to be able to ensure that we're getting revenues that are owed to the city. And so I appreciate the work that they do. That report is in there. And then we have our Sales and Use Tax Report. Um, it includes, it, it shows again, we had a very strong month in February, 23% uh, growth in sales tax. Overall for the year, we're at 19% growth. Uh, sales and use tax combined, we're about $28.8 million over target right now, so it's a really strong year. We're still working on that budget amendment that we'll bring back to the council. And this is one of those times where we want to look at you know, what our reserve policies are, make sure that we're taking a strong year, an exceptionally strong year, and setting aside funds to you know, protect us against shortfalls and, short, uh, and downturns in the future, but also to set capital reserves aside. And we'll bring forward some recommendations, both on a budget amendment and then somewhat sometime after that on um, adjustments to our reserve policy. And so we'll be looking at that in the future. So another very strong month in sales tax, and we'll continue to monitor that and keep you updated. And that's all that I have. All right, thank you. That brings us to item six, Journal of Council Proceedings. We have items A and B we could take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item seven is request for uncontested continuances. We have listed on the agenda item 9V that will be deferred two weeks. What else, Mr. City Manager? We have several items that are on, starting on page six. Item nine, I'm sorry, starting on page 13. Item 11, 11D, PUD 1856. This will be deferred to April 12th. Then on page 15, on item 11Y1, dilapidated structures. We have one item on here, it's item A. 3729 Diana Avenue, we're going to strike this item, the owner has removed. On page 16, on item 11Z1, unsecured structures, all of these items will be stricken from the agenda. Item E, 1133 Linwood Boulevard, we'll strike this, the owner is secured. Item R, 1201 Northwest 36th Street, the owner is secured. Item Y, 10820 Northeast 48th Street, the owner is secured. Item Z, 2928 Southwest 51st Street, the owner is secured. On page 17, item 11, AA1, all of these items will be stricken from the agenda. Item D, 1133 Linwood Boulevard, the owner is secured. Item N, 1201 Northwest 36th Street, the owner is secured. Item X, 10820 Northeast 48th Street, the owner is secured. And then also on page 17, item 11AB, uh, we'll defer this item to March the 15th. And that's all the items that I have. All right. Well, we'll head back now to item eight, revocable permits and events. We have a 
robust list here, which is great. So let's begin with item A. This is a revocable permit with the Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust and Nate the Great Eight, Inc. to hold the Nate the Great Eight race, March 26th at Lake Overholzer. Uh, we do have April Scott who has signed up to speak. Hi, this is also Heather. She is the president of our board. So what our race is, is I lost my son three years ago and we decided as a running community out in Yukon to hold a race every year just to say his name and just to remember him. The first year was COVID. The second year was weird because <laughs> COVID just ended. And so hopefully this year will be the first year when we've actually planned it and people have time to show up and it'll just be a wonderful morning, we hope. All right, um, Ward 1. I look forward to this race, so <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for him. I move for approval. All right. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thanks. Thank Have you. a great event. Okay, item B is activity and use agreement with Arts Council Oklahoma City to present the Festival of the Arts, April 19th through 24th, uh, various locations in downtown. Seth Lewis is here. And Peter DeLisi. Hello. <laughs> Making perhaps his last appearance, I guess, oh, in this capacity. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> we may creep up on you at another time, you know. Uh, uh, I am here with, with Seth Lewis. And actually, we have the two co-chairmen for the event are back there sitting there. That's Kristen Torkelson and John Sempner. They decided to come raw us on this morning. <laughs> Hard to believe this is the 56th annual Festival of the Arts coming up in April, and that last week we had uh, snow and ice everywhere, and then of course this week it'll be 80 degrees at some point a little bit later in the week. We're uh, very excited to uh, be able to bring it to you once again, and we couldn't do it without all the various departments within the city, and uh, Mr. Freeman, I want to thank you especially for the hard work that your team did uh, to once again allow us to use the east side of City Hall. I know that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, logistically a difficult scenario to have to walk through that process, and we really appreciate it. This year that's going to be the children's stage, so it's going to be a, a, a kind of a subdued stage. We're going to move all the children's activities. The judges won't be calling us this time. <laughs> yeah, we, we would hope. We would hope. <laughs> you know, those loud kids, you never know. But uh, in reality, uh, the, most of the time during the day we'll have uh, choirs and all sorts of acts like that. Um, but also, all the children's activities will be on the east side this year, and that's kind of wonderful. And uh, Seth's going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we're getting back to our regular scenario uh, as opposed to how we handled in, in, uh, at the last one in June. Yeah, we're excited to return back to food booths on the International Food Row. So we'll have 22 different food vendors, including um, Arts Council's Mustard's Last Stand, and the return of Strawberries Newport, yes. so everyone can leave those comments alone. They're, they're coming back. Um, we'll have turkey legs, Indian tacos, and bodacious burritos and such. Um, but we're excited to have the kids' activities return, and thank you all for all the hard work you helped us do to get this going. One more thing to mention, we will, we will uh, uh, be having an opening ceremonies that you'll all be invited to. We'll be sending you an invitation out to that. And once again, this year, we're not going to do the officials' luncheon. We've, we're still going to keep that a little bit uh, subdued. It worked really well to hand out uh, vouchers and stuff, so everybody will be getting uh, lunch tickets to come and eat lunch at, at your convenience sometime during the event. We'd love for you all to come to uh, the opening ceremonies on Tuesday morning. Really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilwoman Hammond? Well, yes, we are excited for the return, and I know from my perspective, all the work that goes into using that east side of City Hall is totally worth it. I think it's really neat to have so much life around the people's building um, and just kind of help, hopefully helping folks feel more connected to City Hall and, and knowing that it is really um, somewhere that's accessible for them. Um, so excited uh, to move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a great festival. Okay, item 8C is activity and use agreement with the Oklahoma City National Memorial Foundation for the 2022 Memorial Marathon Run to Remember, April 23rd and 24th. And we have Quincy Taylor, who has signed up to speak. Good morning, all. Um, I'm excited to be here to represent the Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon. I'm joined with Alicia Burgess, who is our registration and volunteer director. 
Um, I'm excited to announce that the marathon will remain a two-day event. Uh, it was pretty loud and clear that our runners requested that after having that in October. So we'll have the kids marathon and the 5K on Saturday, April 23rd, and then the full marathon, the half, and the relay on Sunday, April 24th. So um, we're also excited to kind of round out the community event support with a Josh Abbott band concert on Friday at Scissor Tail Park. We're really excited to really hope out, hope by doing that we're bringing out more than just the runners. We're bringing out the community and really um, the family aspect of it all. So um, yeah, any questions? All right, this affects wards two, six, and seven. So anybody's free to jump in. Well, I know I'm excited. Back in October, Councilman Nice and I were able to go down to the finish line and hand out medals. So hopefully we can do that again. That was really um, exciting and just very, yeah, just that spirit of getting to see so many folks um, finishing. It was, I was like, bless y'all because I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, so unless the other two council members have anything to say, I will move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Have a great race. Thank you. Okay, 8D, revocable right of way use permit with art space at Untitled to hold the Steamroller Print Festival on April 30th on Northeast 3rd Street. And we have Laura Warner who has signed up to speak. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Since we're visual artists, we decided that we would show you what, you're probably wondering what a steamroller festival is. And we take an asphalt um, roller that uh, becomes the press, and we have over 200 artists, Oklahoma City artists, or Oklahoma artists, excuse me, who carve into wood. We then ink the wood block and roll over it with the steamroller and present these prints. It transfers the ink onto paper or fabric or whatever. And uh, this is our fifth uh, steamroller festival, but last year we had over 5,000 people come to the one day event. And so that's why we're here this year. <laughs> and uh, we hope that you will allow us, this is a, a good event for the Deep Deuce District where we are part of. And also it started with our mentorship kids because we mentor 130 to 150 high school students in our programs at ArtSpace. Right, thank you. Please Words. come. <laughs> it's always the last Thursday of April every year. Right, Ward 6 and 7? Did I say last? I think I'll take this one. I, um, okay, I, I will say I was one of those 5,000 people that came last year. And you have to be there to actually understand <laughs> how this works and what happens. Um, and this is an amazing experience. And you get to support young and local talent. And uh, for them to, they did mention the 150 kids. It's not just local kids that they mentor. There's kids from all across Oklahoma that come to this space uh, to, to learn how to do this art. So I am extremely excited. And um, I know that when I was there, I was making all kinds of videos and posting them because, again, you have to see it to believe it. So I'm excited. And I'm sure y'all will be looking for volunteers. Yes. OK. Always. Always looking for volunteers. So if you can be a part of that, I'm sure they would love to welcome you with open arms. So with that, I'll move for approval. All right, we've got a. Motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a Thank great you event. very much. Okay, item 8E is a revocable right of way use permit with McNelly's group to hold the McNelly St. Patrick's Day block party on March 17th. And we have um, Brian Pittman here to speak on this. Hi, everyone. My name, my name is Brian Pittman. I said I'm with McNelly's itself, the James McNelly's uh, Public House, which is at 10th and Walker. Uh, this is going to be our 14th annual St. Patrick's Day block party. Uh, this is going to be the first time in two years that we're actually going to use the street, go back to do a closing the street next to the pub again stuff. We've had the last two indoors. 
and it's been indoors. <laughs> and so uh, this is a big event we always have. This is our main event we have to kick, kick off the summer, the springtime summer events as a whole. Uh, we're looking to close off the walker, which is just next to the pub, just north of 10th Street. That will traffic circle up to by the south side of the uh, 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 Cafe de Brazil. Uh, we have a tent outside, beer trucks outside also, uh, look a couple of satellite bars also, and just some activities to hopefully have good weather like we're going to have this week, unlike last week. So that's our main goal is for the weather time and just to have a lot of fun and have a great time for St. Patrick's Day. It's on, uh, actually going to be on Thursday, March 17th. We, we actually do it every day of the year on actually St. Patrick's Day itself. And I am actually a very small owner in McNally's group. Yes. And so I'm going to step out and turn it over to the vice mayor to complete consideration of this particular item. I did not know that. All right. Uh, whose, whose ward is this in? It's my, for me. All right. Um, yeah, always happy to have more activity outside and um, really engage all of the and uh, animate that public space. So I will move for approval. We have a motion and a second, please. May, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. It's going to sound random, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, have you all, when I was looking at this item, have you all ever done any sort of, kind of to Councilwoman uh, Hammond's point about just activating outside space, um, it just strikes me that in this city, I, to my knowledge, I don't really see big public conversations about the history of the Irish, and specifically Irish Oklahomans. And I, this is kind of, it's, it, it matters as someone who, these freckles, mm -hmm. I came by them honestly, and it's not, a, it's not always a good history. It, it's a very, in a lot of ways, very tragic history. And I just feel like it gets completely erased. And I mean, just completely erased. Um, and I'm just curious, have you all ever thought about at these events, having public speakers um, who can help bring that history to life? In other words, while I love a good beer, trust me, um, I, I don't think that this event is just that. And I, and I really, always kind of worry when I see people just treat this event as, not just at your place, I'm talking nationally, mm -hmm. just treat it as an excuse to get drunk. Can't they do both? Uh, can't, they, can't, <laughs> can't wisdom and Mary exist? And so I don't know if you all have ever thought about that, and maybe it's too late for this year, but I just would kind of encourage everyone to really think about that, that history. Um, and again, I mean, there's a film, this Belfast, I'm not a fan of it, but, you know, that speaks to sort of the history of the Troubles. Um, I don't know. I just feel like it's worth, I don't know, maybe you don't agree, but I, I do, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> we have not thought about that. It's a good thing to look into. I'm going to bring up stuff. So I, I really think for I, this year. <laughs> I really think that you could have James as your first speaker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I would, but I'm telling you, there are yeah. people who know more about this than I do, trust mm -hmm. me. Um, I know what I know, but thank you for entertaining me. Oh, no, you're welcome. That. <laughs> Thanks okay, for bringing it up. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. We have a vote. Uh, I can't tell whether it was unanimous. It was unanimous. Congratulations. Have a great event. Thank you very much, folks. Also, thank you for the input also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Now we're on, I believe, item 8F, unless you did more than I thought you would when I was gone. And that would be a revocable right-of-way use permit with the Oklahoma Family Center for Autism to hold the Run Lucky 5K on March 13th. And we have Brian Pittman here to talk about that item. Well, I'm Tim Thompson. So I'm with uh, Run oh, Lucky. Oh, sorry, yes, Tim Thompson. Yes, yes. my bad. Uh, Run Lucky is his 12th year. Um, it benefits Leukemia uh, Lymphoma Society and Autism Oklahoma. Um, we've partnered with Fossler Hall to have it, um, you know, use their host site uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, March 13th. All right, Councilwoman Hammond. Well, it's going to be a busy week in Midtown that week, so, um, <laughs> but excited to see all of the activity. I'll move for approval. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a great event. Thank you. All right, item 8G is a revocable right-of-way use permit with Redbud Foundation, Inc. to hold the Redbud Classic, April 2nd through the 3rd, Northwest 63rd. And we have 
Kristen Hersom here signed up to speak. Hi, uh, I'm Kristen, thanks for having me. I'm here with the Redbud Classic. Uh, we are in our 39th year for the Redbud, uh, Oklahoma's oldest local racing tradition, and we are super excited after having to cancel 2020, um, unforeseeable circumstances, we had to go virtual last year, so we are super excited for an in-person event. Uh, April 2nd, we will have our bike portion, our kids fun run, and our inaugural woof walk for our furry friends. And then um, April 3rd, we have all of our running events, 5K, 10K, uh, and two mile baby stroller and um, push chair event. All right, uh, wards two and seven, feel free to jump in. Congrats on the longevity. Um, I would just say good luck and uh, take care of everyone out there and move for approval. I don't know if Councilwoman Nice would want to add anything. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we've got a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a great Thank run. Thank you. And finally, item 8H, revocable right-of-way use permit with Stockyard City Main Street, Inc. to hold the Stockyard City St. Patrick's Day Parade on March 12th. And we have Debbie Harrison here. Hi, Debbie. Good morning. How is everyone today? Great. Okay, so on Saturday, March the 12th, will be the uh, Stockyard City St. Patrick's Parade. It starts at 10 a.m. And of course, it's a Celebration of Oklahoma's Irish heritage, and it's also a celebration of the Western culture in the district, and makes a really cool event putting both of those together. So it will be led by the Slasho Ranch Longhorns. There's nowhere else in Oklahoma City that you can see Longhorns being herded down the street. We have a lot of equestrian groups. St. Patrick, of course, will be there. Uh, marching bands, a lot of groups with kilts, and we would like to invite everybody to come for a really fun day. We have some Irish dancers that will be performing uh, and some fun activities for children also. So are there any questions? I'm here to answer them. All right, go ahead, Councilwoman. I don't have any questions, but I'm very excited about the event and glad that we'll be able to expand our ideas of what Irish culture are. I also <laughs> am quite freckled, so I'm excited that the event is um, back in action and I will move for approval. <laughs> All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, uh, where we have items A through J we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. passes unanimously. We'll now adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, uh, where we have items A and B we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we'll adjourn OCPPA and reconvene as the City Council, uh, where we find ourselves on page four of your printed agenda, item nine, the consent docket. We have, uh, of course, item V was previously deferred, and then we have scheduled presentations on BB and BC jointly, uh, and BO, and that's it. Is there any other item that a council member wishes to pull out for a separate vote or separate discussion or comment? Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about BT, T as in Tom. Okay. Mayor, did I hear you correctly? I and I feel like this is true. B O will receive a, a brief. Yes, that's what yes. I thought. thought. That's why. Thank you. Just making sure. Anything else? Okay. If not, we'll take them in order, which means we'll start with uh, B B, B B and B C. Thank you, Mayor. So on item B B, uh, B B and B C are our companion items. So the first one is item B B. This is. Mm -hmm. Um, the recommendations from the Law Enforcement Policy Task Force and the Community Policing Working Group. And then item BC is an extension of our contract with 21CP. They were our consultants that worked with us on the recommendations. 
Um, we're going to work with one of their consultants uh, to do some pro do project management for us as we work towards implementation of the recommendations from the task force and the working group. Um, I really do uh, want to acknowledge the um, in the presentation this morning we'll get an update on the process of what we went through to uh, come back with these recommendations and then uh, we'll also have a, re a review of the recommendations. So M.T. Berry actually uh, worked for us. He's our former police chief, former assistant city manager. He worked with us to provide the recommendation, uh, to work as a facilitator for the law enforcement policy task force. And then Kenton Sudel, assistant city manager, worked with the law enforcement working group on the recommendations. Um, I'm going to have MT come up and let MT give us just an introduction here and talk about the process a little bit. And then Brian Maxey with 21CP will give us the overview of the recommendations. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Great to be here. Good to see everyone. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. We're going to talk, first of all, about the timeline that uh, the whole project, the working group project, and the Law Enforcement Policy Task Force. In June of 2020, in response to community concerns regarding policing in the Oklahoma City Police Department, the City Council passed a resolution creating a community policing working group. The working group focused on six major initiatives and those initiatives and corresponding recommendations will be discussed a little later on in this presentation. Additionally, in July of 2020, the mayor announced the formation of the Law Enforcement Policy Task Force. <clears throat> the task force was given a defined mission to review and evaluate the police department's de-escalation, accountability, and transparency policies and practices, and develop recommendations for city council and the city manager's consideration. The task force recommendations will also be discussed a little later in this presentation. In August of 2020, the Community Policing Working Group and Law Enforcement Policy Task Force held their first meetings. I was hired to facilitate the work of the task force. My role, among others, was to guide the group discussions to consensus, encourage the sharing of diverse perspectives, to ensure a respectful environment existed in which to do so. I'm extremely honored to have, been, have served in this capacity. In September of 2020, a request for proposals was issued for a consultant with experience in providing engagement, analysis and recommendations regarding specific law enforcement practices and related topics. Four responses to the RFP were received in October of 2020 and were evaluated by a, an eight member oversight committee made up of volunteers from the task force and the working group. At the conclusion of their work, the oversight committee recommended 21 CP solutions be awarded the consultant contract. Later, the working group and the task force also agreed with that recommendation. So in December of 2020, 21 CP Solutions was hired as the consultant for the task force and the working group. On the next two slides, you will see the names of members of the working group and task force. These people put in a lot of hours, did a lot of hard work, did a lot of brainstorming, research, things along those lines. And I would just like to thank them publicly for their work uh, towards getting us to this stage. And I'm not sure if any of the uh, task force or working group members are here today. If you would please stand. Yes. Next, I'd like to call to the uh, podium uh, Brian Maxey, 21CP. So I want to say thanks also to MT for his work. Come on up, Brian. Um, and let me let them know, everyone know how much I appreciate MT's leadership in this, but all the task force members, the working group members, um, staff members who worked on this, the community members who engaged in the community engagement. Uh, it's been a combined process here to come forward with these recommendations, and I appreciate the work of 21CP uh, and working with us as a consultant to bring us these recommendations. 
Good morning, Mayor, City Council members. Thank you very much for having us here to present on what was a year-long project uh, with your community, your police department, and many stakeholders that are listed up above. Um, as we outlined in our report, this, this project was primarily about engagement. It was in, about engagement with the communities, with the working group, with the task force, with the oversight committee, with the police department, and with um, many members of city government as well. And if we could just move to the next slide, please. And one more, please. What I'm going to try to do here today is summarize what is an 85-page report with 39 discrete recommendations. It is long, and 21 CP typically does not do executive summaries for our reports precisely because they are interwoven, they are nuanced, they are uh, thorough, and they do require a, a deep dive and a, and a comprehensive read. So if you haven't had the time, I really would encourage you to read the 85 pages because what we're trying to do is um, bring a whole bunch of diver diverse perspectives together uh, and give you some rational, actionable recommendations that will improve public safety here in Oklahoma City. So brief background, 21CP is a national organization that was created by many members of Obama's task force uh, on policing that happened back in 2015. Those, those members came together to form an organization to carry forward that work that they started under that task force to um, help police departments uh, develop best practices and critically analyze some of the emerging theories and ideas around policing. I think it's no uh, surprise to this group that you know, policing in the last few years has uh, undergone extreme scrutiny. There's a lot of transformation that's happening. There's a lot of um, progressive new ideas that are being tested. And what, we're to, what we try to do at 21CP is find those solutions that will work for an individual community and police department and help to advance the ball through that mechanism. So we were brought to Oklahoma City to look at eight uh, discrete areas. This was not a full comprehensive assessment of the police department or its activities. We did not do a, for example, a review of use of force cases, looking at all use of force over a period of time with a statistically significant sample in order to evaluate those outcomes. Instead, the focus here really was on community voices and interviews and engagement. Um, the first two topics were those that were uh, of law enforcement de-escalation policy and the independent law enforcement accountability to the community. Those were the tasks that the task force was uh, directed to engage with. All of the others uh, were for the working group, and that was the law enforcement training and crisis response, alternative response to mental health calls, law enforcement focus uh, on youth outreach, on a neighborhood safety violence interruption program, and mental health services for officers, as well as the role of policing in homeless um, outreach initiatives. Uh, the last two, were also analyzed by other consultants. Code 4 did an analysis of the mental health services uh, that officers receive, and the Mayor's Task Force on Homelessness uh, did the initial deep dive into outreach initiatives and the role of the police. So as I said, this project was primarily about engagement. The task force, the working group, the oversight committee, community. So as part of um, our work, we asked the task force, the working group, and oversight committee, you know, uh, community leaders in Oklahoma City to provide us with names and contacts, um, mechanisms of outreach. We held a town hall. We participated in local town halls, local events, uh, tried to connect as much as we could with stakeholders and those interested in the evolution of policing in Oklahoma City. As a result, uh, we ended up contacting hundreds of individuals and having one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to talk. It is absolutely true that we did not speak to everyone. We were not able to connect with it, but we did our best. We had an email portal for comments. We received almost 100 comments specifically 
uh, on that email portal. And again, we did regular one-on-one -on -one interviews um, with the community. This presentation began with thanks. Our report also begins with thanks. When you look at the community um, portion of our report, there are a lot of people that are exhausted by engagement on this topic. They've been working for years and shoveling sand against the tide is a phrase we heard quite frequently. So we thank all of those people that did come to the table, continued to engage, continued to invest, even while discouraged. And, uh, and none of this report could have happened without them. One other community engagement piece that was uh, part of this process is that uh, ETC, which is a consulting company for surveys out of Kansas, did a, a survey of households in OKC. They, they contacted over 1,600 discrete households. Their initial benchmark target was 1,200, so there was an overwhelming response. And what really came out of that, um, out of that survey was an appreciation that across political spectrums and demographics, the people in OKC support improving the police department. And uh, we actually tested some of the um, recommendations that we had in our initial recommendations early on in the process where we roadmap this is where we think we're going. We tested those in the survey and all of those recommendations that we were able to test had a 90 plus percent approval rating in the, in the survey. So as it says up there above in bold, our takeaway is that creating accountable, equitable community safety services is not a political issue. It is a practical challenge and getting it right is important to all of OKC. So what I'm gonna to attempt to do is go through the report. We have limited time and I actually think I need to get out to your River Sports Center as quickly as possible, so I will attempt to be brief. Um, but this is really just a roadmap of what's in the report. Um, starting with de-escalation, there was a clear disconnect between the department's belief on where it was on de-escalation and the community perspectives on where the police department was on de-escalation. The department has a, has a strong policy. It lays out expectations for officers. It is mandatory and Impressively, the department in its force review processes specifically looks at de-escalation as a component of that review. Many departments do not. So the structures in the police department are actually quite strong. We were initially just asked, look at the policy. Short answer to that, policy is good and strong. However, we went further in, in our work because, again, this was about engagement and we were hearing from the community that how can you have a department with a strong policy and strong training and we're not pleased with the outcomes on the street. Obviously each case needs to be reviewed individually for, what, for its merits, but it was clear that the communities wanted to see the effects of policy in action. So there are a few things that we recommended in response to this. One is de-escalation is currently a procedure. Procedures are expectations of how officers will perform um, in, in the streets and, and according to department values, but the policy level is the highest level within uh, the OKC PD. You have policies, procedures, rules. We think it should be elevated up because de-escalation is not just how an officer engages with an individual, it is how the department should situate itself in terms of values. And so we recommend escalating the policy there to highlight it as a core de uh, departmental value. In terms of use of force, uh, right now the department requires a warning when um, officers are gonna use lethal force or when they're gonna use a taser. We recommend that when safe and feasible, officers give a warning in all circumstances. Let, let the person know what, what is going to happen if they do not comply. Obviously there will be times when this is not safe and feasible and office, officers will need to react immediately, but taking the time to lay out options to say, here, this is what's about to happen, or at the very least say, this is coming, uh, is, is a major um, plus for de-escalation efforts. De-escalation is also um, married up with training. It's hard to separate the two. Um, and a lot of what we heard when we tried to talk about de-escalation really was about cultural awareness and uh, 
cultural understanding of the police department for the communities that it served. And again, the community perceived a, a, um, a disconnect there. Um, so what we recommend is that the city uh, partner with the community to create trainings. Instead of trying to have the police department develop a training on the history of OK CPD and um, in interactions with the community, have the community do it. Some, some jurisdictions do this in forms of micro-grants where they say, here, here's some money to different groups that apply, and then that group can develop the training that is then subsequently delivered to the police department. The other thing is really around transparency. Part of healing some of this disconnect is showing your work. And we really recommend that OKCPD continue its efforts to be very transparent about its activities. Ideally, all officer activities would be publicly presented in aggregate statistics saying, this is the number of contacts, this is the number of uses of force, here are the number of complaints, here's how they were resolved. Simply show your work and that, um, then the community can look at that and assess it for themselves. In terms of accountability and de-escalation, where there is also um, overlap, we have recommended that, off that OKCPD prohibit officers from viewing video evidence before providing an interview in critical events, such as officer-involved shootings. I recognize this will be a difficult uh, thing to achieve. There will be a lot of opposition to this. But fundamentally, officers that view video before providing a statement their memories are changed. It's not their fault, they're not trying to lie, but the science shows that it actually changes their perception of what happened. And you know, I've, we've worked strongly with you know, some of the best trainers for the FBI that, that look at the effects of this on officer recall. And it is a, uh, there's, there's a practical and a legal reason why this is a good um, practice. If an officer's memory is going to be changed, you want to capture the purest form of what did they perceive. What, ha what really happened is a secondary question. All of the legal analysis around use of force is based on what a reasonable officer perceived on scene. If you don't capture what that reasonable officer perceived and you allow their memory to be changed by viewing the video, you are altering the evidence. Again, this is not the blame game here. I'm not saying there's something insidious that officers are doing, and in fact, our recommendation is very clear that any policy that goes down this road needs to take into account that officer perceptions will deviate from objective evidence like video. It's not a matter of being dishonest. It's a matter of the human experience versus the digital experience. We also recommend in terms of accountability that OKCPD okay, eliminate the waiting period for interviewing officers that who have been involved in an officer-involved shooting or critical incident. And ideally, we recommend that officers be interviewed by end of shift. There is a lot more in the report on this. It's not as simple as it seems. Currently, there's a mandatory 48-hour waiting period. The problem with that is the science doesn't back that up. It does back up the idea that an office, if an officer or any witness is traumatized, you should not be doing the interview at that moment. So it, what we're really recommending is a health-based assessment wellness-based assessment. How is the officer doing? If they are in a state to give the interview, do it. Don't wait some artificial period of time, um, uh, but get to it. So um, again, there's a lot more in the report on that, and I recommend looking a little bit more at the science there. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, community advisory board, this is the second piece that the task force really grappled with. and we. When we were doing the work, we divided the working group, sorry, the task force into two subcommittees, one focused on de-escalation, one focused on uh, accountability, which really was a review of the community advisory board. And what was clear is that the, the current community advisory board, is it, people in the community do not know what it is, they don't know what the work is, they have no visibility into it, and therefore they have no trust with it. Um, we have a lot of recommendations in here. Uh, the first one that I wanted to highlight is that the, uh, the CAB, the membership of this, who sits on this, there's no real transparency to the, the appointments. They're indefinite. Um, I think there's a lack of confidence 
in the people that are on there, not necessarily because they haven't done good, solid work along the way, but because they're unknown and they're, because there's a lack of transparency in their appointments, there's some uh, concern within community about who they are and what they represent and a strong feeling that they um, are, uh, that they continue the status quo rather than trying to uh, push for the evolution of police. Um, in parallel to that, we recommend that OKC engage in a comprehensive education campaign to highlight the work and authority of the CAB. This is probably after uh, recommendation 13 there, where you figure out the structure of it, then you need to educate the community on it. The CAB desperately needs an administrative staff person. It has actually a lot of authority. It's asked to review cases, review processes, engage with the community. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to get done there. Currently, the Professional Standards Bureau at OKCPD is providing the administrative support. I think both practically that's not ideal and also optically. Uh, the police department should not be the one that's controlling the um, the access to information of the CAB. And again, I think they're doing so in good faith, but having, having an administrative staff person that works for the board to gather the information, present the information, and coordinate the efforts would be very, very helpful. Um, and this is perhaps the most important one here, is um, the city needs to allow the CAB to publicly report on its activities. Right now, the CAB can only report to the chief of police and the city manager. Uh, the CAB should be able to, as a community representative group, tell the community what it's seeing. I'm not talking about individual cases. I'm not talking about confidential information. I'm just talking about if they hold the community meeting and things are brought up, they should be able to report out publicly on it. If they see process problems and they make recommendations to the police department, they should be able to say that publicly because that is really their power is through engaging with the public to say, we see problems, let's see if we can move the ball on policies or uh, review processes of the police department. Transparency, uh, there's many recommendations around transparency here. Um, the first one here is really there should be a very simple roadmap of expectations for when a civilian files a complaint. What's going to happen? What are the timelines? When am I going to hear back? What, what can I expect? And we included an infographic out of Baltimore that just lays this out very simply um, so that there's better understanding of what these processes are. Um, right now, although the city uh, commendably does accept uh, uh, anonymous complaints, there's no way to file one uh, except by phone. Uh, there are many. There's a web form, email address, other ways that complaints are accepted, but all of those require you to identify yourself. So we just are recommending an anonymous web form be provided so that people can do that. Okay, alternatives to armed response. Um, perhaps the, I, I think the biggest takeaway from the report is this, this concept really is about multidisciplinary approaches to public safety. You have a lot going on that has traditionally defaulted to the police. The police tend to exist at the end of failed systems. So when mental health, youth engagement, persons in crisis all fall to the police department and there is a desire to ensure that the right resource is diverted, um, it, it, it's perhaps more, uh, instead of thinking of who can we send other than the police, it's who can we send that will best resolve this for the benefit of all involved, for the person in crisis, for the officer, for the mental health worker. So think about it in terms of, of proper response. Um, we did talk about uh, preference points in hiring for officer candidates that have mental health experience, certification or degrees or, or social work experience. If you can get that education up front, that's a value to the department ahead of time. Um, comprehensive training plan for uh, CIT officers. We spent a lot of time on the task force talking about CIT and the value of training officers to provide mental health um, and crisis response. And it, you know, our takeaway was that it, it, while it's commendable to try to build up um, different multidisciplinary approaches, at the end of the day when no one else is available, it's a cop that's going. 
And if that is the case, and we believe it will be for quite some time into the future, uh, that officer needs to be trained to appropriately handle those, um, those circumstances. So what the department has now is a reality-based training um, group that is providing scenario-based training. This is excellent. It's a step in the right direction. But what we're looking for is like a coordinated plan of, you know, here is the 100 series, 200, 300 series of crisis and intervention and mental health such that your new officers are getting what they need and it's being reinforced at a more advanced level for your senior officers. You know, as part of this, um, there are a lot of resources in OKC. They're not coordinated. They're at the government level, they're at the nonprofit level, they're at the faith-based level. There's a whole host of activity that's going on. And what we recommend is the city create a crisis intervention committee to bring together these resources to um, coordinate them and to advise the department on the best way of engaging with those. I mean, something as simple as a resource map would go a long way. Um, we also are recommending that the city issue a, a request for information or a request for proposal to really understand what the landscape of resources is. As you develop multidisciplinary responses and you need different resources, it is important to identify what those are. So in our analysis of youth, I think um, we had three major recommendations. One is create a youth advisory board, and we recommend they have access to command staff on a regular basis. Two is to uh, ensure that the youth outreach programs are fu funded, remain a priority, and are a part of a public information effort. Again, there's a lot of stuff the department is doing and the city is doing. It's not well publicized, and I think there's a lack of understanding at the community level. The school resource officers, we heard, again, a big disconnect, and community has a long memory. And what we heard from a lot of community members were that the truancy enforcement was uh, over, overly harsh, um, heavy-handed, and non-productive. What we heard from the department was, yes, we know that we've created what they have, they have the YES program, which focuses on providing support directly to families and children that are not um, engaging with school. So they've, they've completely changed their philosophy to understand that kids not showing up in school is often an indicator of a far deeper uh, family crisis and they're doing their best to provide support on the, on the back end for that rather than using the hammer of truancy. In homelessness, th this is pretty s simple. This, uh, in keeping with the mayor's task force on homelessness, Homelessness is not a policing issue. There are criminal crimes that happen in, in homeless communities and those need to be dealt with by the police, but the police are not the face of the engagement. They're not the primaries. So I think the police department and the city both recognize the police need to take a secondary role in this and allow um, those trained in homelessness, mental health, and other issues just to take the lead and you know, the police can ensure they're safe. Um, we also recommend that OKC consider whether to modify ordinances for quality of life crimes to individuals ex experiencing homelessness. This goes right into the theme of homelessness is not a crime. There's a lot of things that are happening um, around homelessness, um, but enforcing quality of life crimes uh, on that population is simply counterproductive. And just as a value, I guess it's this body actually that needs to consider what to do with that. This can be summarized very quickly. Uh, the Code 4 report was thorough, comprehensive, and the department's beginning to engage in this. Officer wellness is the sixth pillar of the uh, Obama Task Force uh, policing plan. It is incredibly important. I think the, the line that keeps coming up is that hurt people hurt people. You've got to ensure that you have wellness support for your first responders of, of any, any type, whether they're you know, civilian, fire, uh, or officer, just to ensure that they're in the headspace to properly engaged. There are a lot of good recommendations there, and our recommendation is do it. Get the mental health providers, fund it, uh, continue with what was recommended in that report, because there's a lot of good things there that will shore up uh, officer wellness. And the last part really comes down to implementation. Um, 
right now there is there is a option on the table to have 21 CP continue this work. It will not be me. It would be Ganesha Martin, who many on the task force and the working group have come to know. I think her work here has been very appreciated. She could not be here today. Um, but regardless of whether it's 21 CP, we do need the city to take either a contract or a permanent position to drive this. These, these changes are not things that happen by themselves. It takes a lot of focus and will and dedication, both from the community, government leaders, and from an implement, implementor, someone that can have this be their full-time focus. Um, as this is happening, and as the city chooses which of these recommendations to move forward with, being transparent about it, putting it up on the website, having an implementation portal to show the progress so that if any member of the community says, hey, what's going on in this area, they should be able to find out and without having to call or um, have extraordinary efforts. So we're really just recommending full transparency. I realize I've taken a little more than um, was anticipated here. I will stop talking. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, though, but thank you again for the opportunity to engage with OKC. Thanks, Brian. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to mention that I appreciate, and I know they'll probably, staff, uh, council will probably have questions for you here, but I wanted to just stress that what we're asking the council to do today is receive these recommendations, and um, then we will charge with staff, with myself, working with Ganesha, working on developing project implementation plan, bring information back to the council, let you know how we're moving forward. And there will be actions that we'll be taking on each individual piece. Some, some of these are actions that we can take in terms of increasing training or something like that that may not require council action, but many of these will require council action. And so you'll, you'll see more of this as we go along and what we're doing right now is just asking you to receive the report so we can move forward with these recommendations. Yeah, the one thing I'd say is I received a couple of calls yesterday and there was some confusion uh, with the media in that we were approving today all of these 39 recommendations. And in our conversation yesterday that you and I had, I felt much more comfortable in understanding this is a receiving process and this is the next leg of, of what we are going to do. And that includes uh, participating with uh, the chief of police, his staff, the assistant city managers, yourself, uh, the FOP with Mark Nelson, and, and starting to look at these 39 different recommendations and deciding how we want to implement some, all, uh, in, in, as part of the process. And, and, and I felt much better after talking to you is that, that you're going to, and I, I want the city of Oklahoma City to understand, that you're going to come back to us and you're going to let us know what you're looking at from an implementation standpoint. Yes, sir. Other comments or questions? We're done with like presenting, right? Yes. Okay, so yeah, now's a good time. We do have people who've signed up to speak, but if there's comments or questions right now. Yes, David. Just a few clarification questions. Yes, sir. So early in the report, you indicated that or identified a recommendation concerning warnings in situations other than when use of force is necessary. Uh, Council member, uh, Sort of. The, the, the current state of affairs is that officers are required under OKCPD policy to give a warning before using deadly force when safe and feasible sure. and for um, when they're using a taser when safe right. and feasible. But outside of those two instances, I think you also indicated a warning should be used. That is correct. In use of force situations. So oh, if so you're going to go like hand a regular traffic stop, you're not? No. I'm not saying is, no, that would, that would actually, I think, go against um, de-escalation concepts to right. immediately lead with some form of warning or threat about possibilities. Instead, it's when that time is coming, when you've attempted to de-escalate, talk through a situation, and you're about to go hands-on, you're about to use a baton, you're about to use pepper spray, you're, you're about to take some physical force action is to communicate the intent to the person, unless it would not be safe or feasible. There are circumstances when doing that will set someone off and create, you know, escalate the situation. Yes. So it does take some sophistication and nuance to navigate it, but when safe and feasible, it's a good practice. I, I misunderstood, I'm sorry. So another clarification. So you indicated that you'd like to see community groups and the police department work closer together 
better interfacing in a roll call situation? Can you? So this goes back to the, the, the community created training. In other words, if there is a, a, a community, identify a community group, I'll pick one, the matriarchs of indigenous communities, uh -huh. and they would uh, be able to create a training video for OKCPD about what, how their community engages with the police, some of the historic fears, some of the concerns, some of the reactions that might come culturally out of an engagement with the police. Whatever it is they want to tell the police, give them the resources to create a roll call video, 10, 15 minute video that could then be played at roll call training or whatever training situation the police department deems you know, most appropriate. It just develops the content directly out of the community. Okay, thank you, that, that was helpful. Uh, and I'll try to be quick, I just have a couple more items. So uh, this is not a discussion about whether we should adopt it or not, I'm just asking for clarification. But in the situation where police officers are interviewed, currently there's a mandatory waiting period of 48 hours, is that correct? That is correct. And you would recommend, or your recommend, or CP21's recommendation is that that 48 hour requirement, minimum requirement, be eliminated and we look at each situation on a case by case basis, is that correct? That is correct. I would and, recommend having you know, standards and a checklist of what, how you're evaluating those situations. Yeah, and you said that it's not a good idea to interview anybody in a state of uh, uh, the term you use. Trauma. Trauma, yes. So that could be earlier than 48 hours. Could it ever be longer than 48 hours? Could someone be in a state of trauma that lasted more than 48 hours? I, I, absolutely, that, that could, could happen. That will run up against the uh, the new policy to release subjective evidence, including video, within 10 days. So again, balancing the interests of getting that interview done, respecting whatever trauma state the officer is in, and the release of that video, and not wanting the officer to see the video, those timelines will have to flex in relationship to each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, in regards to going forward, I think I read in the report that during the initial stage or this past year, uh, the consultants visited Oklahoma City twice. That is correct. We were physically out here twice. One was for community engagement and one was for the subcommittee engagement and talking to the police department and city. Okay. In terms of implementation, should your company be engaged how often do you anticipate being here in person? I would think it would be more frequent than before. Certainly, you know, the health circumstances and travel uh, options are greatly increased. I know that part of the uh, discussions around the engagement is we still need someone here on the ground to be a contact point that has the everyday on the ground ties to the community, so we would work with them, we would come out. I, I don't know how frequently exactly, it would sort of be um, work dependent on what the cadence of the recommendation was and what needed direct personal attention. But okay. it's not a full time Just, on the ground situation. Yeah, the one thing in talking to Craig uh, is my understanding that this would be driven more by what we want someone to do sure. and paying for them on an hourly rate when we wanted them to do something not just and, them. And, and Ganesha has experience implementing, doing implementations like this in other cities. Mm -hmm. And so we will meet with her and discuss this of what our plan would be. And then we'll discuss together how frequently that she would be here and then who the contact would be here. We'll get all those details worked out. Okay, thank you. And, and thanks for clarifying that. Yes. That it's up to 200,000. That's right, it's, not, it's not a commitment of 200,000. It's up to that amount. And that we'll evaluate that and use that based on what the needs are. <coughs> Okay. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I have to interject just one, one more thing on that. And then I, I'm holding back on my comments till I hear from our people, of course. Um, but in terms of the 21CP's physical presence in 
the history of this work that we've done, they may, not have, they may have only been here those two times in person, but the number of virtual meetings we had, uh, the number of virtual meetings that we had, whether it was the law enforcement task force meetings that were regularly scheduled, whether it was uh, Helm Farm Neighborhood Association had one, um, Edgemere Park, where uh, Representative Marie Turner, uh, they and I co-hosted. I mean, we had virtual and in-person, and it was a lot. So I just wanted to clarify that for anybody listening. And certainly, we want to take advantage of that as much as we can, of, of not requiring the travel. But I think being here on the ground and understanding what's going on within the community is also very valuable. OK. Uh, so in many years, I was involved in consulting engagements on both sides. And so this is a often asked question, will you all assume responsibility for the successful implementation of these recommendations? So again, that would depend on what we are asked to do as part of that. We are not coming in to be the sole entity to implement. So I don't think I can say yes. Yeah, we can guarantee all, I would the say success. ultimately that's my responsibility and what I expect with 21CP is they're helping to guide us in this process with their experience to help us to be successful. There's something, if there was a recommendation that required a state law change and depending on how far we go with certain recommendations, none of us can control that. And so I think for them it's really helping us to set us up to be successful, but how successful we are in each individual um, endeavor, you know, whether we come back to the council and the council approves it or if it's something we have to negotiate and whether it gets approved, that, that all is going to be determined. Thank you. So here's a concern in the for-profit sector. When consultants take too large of a role, a concern is that uh, first line managers, supervisors, staff people, as they go forward, start thinking, well, what would the consultant want me to do in this situation? And they forget the managerial hierarchy in the organization. You know, they forget about the, the policies and procedures in place and start trying to react to what they think the consultant wants from them. They should be in congruence and not creating discrepancies between that. But the key is, and this is why, you know, in the for-profit sector, they've got to make that clear distinction. We're responsible. You follow the hierarchy of command and what you've been trained to do, that's how you complete your job and not spend too much time focusing on what consultants have been telling you. Yeah, definitely they're a partner in this. It, I have the responsibility ultimately, and I will, I, I like the idea that we're engaging with 21CP and particularly with Ganesha with her experience with this, her experience engaging with the community, working with police departments. They'll provide us a lot of guidance. Up, ultimately, it's us being responsive to the city council, to our organization within the community. And so that's, we'll take all of those into consideration as we look at that. It'll definitely be that they're working for us, we're not working for them. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before we go to citizens to I've, be heard? I've got a quick question, yeah, talk. Mayor. Uh, you use the term quality of life crimes versus homelessness criminalization. Can you describe for me quality of life crimes? Sure, things like public urination, um, open container laws, uh, that sort of thing that is if someone lives on the street, it creates a different environment for those quality of life crimes to surface where criminalization of it and enforcement of that is, is counterproductive. Um, it, it's very different than, you know, if, if, if I were to go outside and pop open a beer on the street, it might be, it's a very different thing than someone that is actually living on the street and doesn't have alternatives to that. That's what we're referring to. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we've had some people. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. We've had some people sign up to speak, and, uh, and so I'll invite them up. And I might also, for the sake of efficiency, say the name that's, that I expect to come afterwards um, so that person can maybe come down. And there are some seats in the front row. 
uh, or they can at least get ready. So first up will be Nicole McAfee, followed by Fiona Morford. And if each person, of course, would state your name and address and keep your remarks to three minutes or less. Hello, my name is Nicole McAfee. My pronouns are she and they. And I'm a resident of Ward 6. 2018, Jacob Mahau, 35. Tony Lamont Mathis, 47. Chris Stone, 32. Hayden Taylor, 26. Paul Strickland, 55. William Patrick Young, 56. 2019, Elray Barber, 55. Justin Anderson, 39. Michael John, 24. Leo Craig Jr., 31. Brian Dreyer, 28. Quinton Broadus, 33. Vincent Dwayne Williams, Jr., 24. 2020, Benny Edwards, 60. Stavian Rodriguez, 15. Michael Dansby, 43. Brandon Milburn, 37. Kyle Elrod, 30. Samuel Lanham, 50. 2021, Daniel Hobbs, 34. Curtis Montrell Williams, 35. Tilford Barton, 30. Joel Lewis, 63. That's every person I can find who was killed immediately by OKCPD since 2018. We know that list is incomplete because it doesn't include folks who died later from an injury. It doesn't include the impacts on broader family and our community. In the 1860s, in the height of the Civil War, bounty hunters sent to catch slaves in slave patrols, dead or alive, earned about $100 per person, about 300, or about 3,000 in modern dollars. In 2021, the Oklahoma City Council put a bounty a thousand times that for each person killed by OKCPD. Mm. A $3.5 million bounty for each name on that 2021 list. I'm not here today because I think these recommendations are exceptional. I think many reinforce an institution that has showed us time and time again does not keep our community safe. I do value the fact that there's some harm reduction in these recommendations. I do value the labor of especially the black and brown folks. 30 seconds remaining. Of the folks from other purposefully historically excluded identities who had to do the deep work to provide these recommendations. So I ask you today to not just to see, receive but approve these recommendations, not because they're adequate, but because I'm unwilling to wait until OKCPD kills yet another resident to see if you finally have the political courage to take meaningful steps towards disrupting and divesting from the institution of policing. Wow. <laughs> Morford and Fiona Morford will be followed by Marcy King. Hi, my name is Fiona Morford. I am a resident of Ward 3, Councilwoman Young. I'm here today to show my support for these recommendations from 21CP. I'm a member of Boiling Point Organization, a organization here in Oklahoma City uh, that was created to fight racial injustice. And I'll, again, I just want to show my support for these recommendations. These are the first steps that we as a city can take to make our city safer, to hold our city government and policy officers accountable, and to save the lives of citizens and po police officers of the city of Oklahoma City. We as citizens support these recommendations, including body cams, releases, and mental health alternatives with a large majority. As Councilwoman Hammond, Still, uh, said in our op-ed in the Sunday edition of the Oklahoman. It is time for Oklahoma City to start to take, start to change its way it reviews public safety. It is proven across the country that preventative methods such as the cure violence programs saves money and lives when compared to the effectiveness of the response-based methods that we use today. And when the levels of violence are so disproportionate for the black indigenous persons of color, 
these recommendations will impact the most marginalized groups the most. And if none of what has been said already maybe gets to you, maybe money will. As Councilwoman Hammond said in her op-ed, these programs such as the Cure Violence uh, programs save the taxpayer tens of dollars, dozens of dollars to the dollar spent on them. Thank you and please help make the city safer. Thank you. Marcy King. Marcy King. Mary King. Sorry. Mary King followed by Walker Milligan. Hello, my name is Mary King. I am a mother, a small business owner, and a resident of Ward 2. I grew up in Oklahoma City. I am worried about the continued and increasing investment in the Oklahoma City Police Department, especially since it diverts funds from programs that more effectively address the root causes of many safety issues, including mental illness and substance abuse. In the past year, I have had two dangerous encounters with individuals who suffer from mental illness and substance abuse that seriously threatened my safety. I typically choose not to involve police in these matters because it is not effective and endangers the lives of those in my community. However, at the behest of others involved in the matter, I ended up notifying the Oklahoma City Police Department in both instances. Due to the time constraint, I only speak to the, of the first instance, but please know that both of these are illustrations of what happens when we leave these matters to police officers. The first case involved my next door neighbor who suffered from severe mental and physical health problems as a result of substance abuse. He lived with extended family in the house next door. He had been harassing me and trying to enter my house at night, also knocking on my bedroom window while I was sleeping and occasionally yelling and saying inappropriate and sexual things as I walked from my front door to my car. His family was desperate to get him into a care facility but lacked the money to pay for it. They urged me to call the police because they felt that if there was documentation of his erratic behavior, it might help in their application for funding for facilities for full-time care. When the police officer showed up, the neighbor was already in an ambulance parked right in front of my neighbor's house. The officer never attempted to go talk to my neighbor or have any kind of conversation with him to deal with the situation. Instead, he stood on, stood on my front porch and told me I should probably purchase a gun and a security camera system to keep myself and my daughter safe. When he was there, another officer responding to the call drove up. Without leaving his car, he greeted the officer on my porch. They joked about how the person who had threatened my safety was in the ambulance, so their job there was done. They never asked me what would happen when my neighbor was discharged from the hospital in a couple of days. They never attempted to talk to my neighbor's family to find effective solutions or resources that would increase everyone's sense of safety. Also again, they never talked to the neighbor who had been threatening my safety. These actions feel like the bare minimum. As a result, I felt unsafe in my own house at night for months until this neighbor passed away. I feared for my daughter's safety. I felt unsafe being outside in my front or backyard because I could see him watching me and sometimes hear him yelling at me. I now know through direct experience that increasing officer presence will definitely not lead to a greater sense of safety. Therefore, it is somehow left up to me, a single mom who lives alone with her seven-year-old daughter, to protect myself and my daughter. And I don't understand how the Oklahoma City Police Department can continue to take public funds and my tax dollars while doing so little to affect my sense of safety and the safety of those in my community. I urge you to vote to review the 21C, rec 21C rep recommendations and to accept them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Walker Milligan. And Walker Milligan will be followed by Matthew Leverage. Hello, my name is Walker Milligan. I'm a mental health therapist and I live in Ward 2. Uh, accepting these recommendations should be a given. You ask the community to be patient with this process that began in the summer of 2020, which they have been. You hired consultants, they met with the community, and the professionals have given you the product you paid them for. I'm here to ask you to use the power of this council to move as quickly as possible with implementation of these recommendations. The most fundamental goal of this process is for the Oklahoma City Police to kill less residents and to hold them accountable when any residents are killed. Kill less residents, our fellow residents of this city. I have a hard time believing that anyone on this council doesn't believe that's a worthwhile goal. I have a hard time imagining that anyone in this room doesn't think that's a worthwhile goal, that we should kill less residents of our city and to hold people accountable when people die. 
However, it's time that we start to show that with our actions. As I said, I'm a mental health therapist. When I work with my clients, I often do an exercise where I have them list out their values, and then we go through their current actions to see how those are lining up with their values. We don't list their words or their thoughts, only their actions. Lining up our words and our action, or lining up our values and our actions is an important step in building on an identity we can be proud of. I'd ask each of you to spend some time reflecting on this exercise. I'd encourage you to consider this as we move forward with this process. What are your core values? What actions would be in line with those values? These recommendations and their implementation are an opportunity for this city to take action based on its stated values. Today, you have an opportunity to show all of us exactly what your values are and how you plan to live out those values in your life. Thank you. Matthew Leverage, and Matthew will be followed by T. Cherie Dickerson. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Leverage. I live at 2620 Northwest 15th Street. Uh, in the great 73107. Uh, I want to thank the seven, apologize if I missed count, I want to thank the seven um, officers in uniform for being present, um, as well as the, I think, four uh, um, officers outside in tactical uniform as we exchange this public discourse. Um, the, uh, the, the um, hearing from uh, the 21CP's uh, contributions to this council's meeting, um, it's not perfect, um, but it does sound like it's um, it's a nice it's, it's a nice um, accumulation of public concerns um, uh, with some really nice insight. Um, there are difficult parts of being a police officer. There is uh, there's a human element to every work, every job in this in this city. It has a human element to it, and that is imperfect. Um, I think that um, the job is extremely difficult. And what the 21 CP recommendation is, is to make the total workload for police officers less difficult. It's just my belief, and I just respectfully have that. Where I have um, uh, to assume for, for to t and when you have the aspect of, uh, of, a, of a city's budget, a police budget, and you have money that's going to be diverted away from the police funding, I, I can understand how police officers would, uh, and police unions and organizations would, would feel that, think that's a negative. But there is a state motto that labor conquers all. And there are an, a large amount of people that, are, that have years of education, hundreds of hours of training um, towards dealing with these people in crisis. And these people rarely make them the amount of money that, that they deserve, but they are still willing to get up every day and do the work. I think that putting, um, putting more of the city's budget towards those people which already have the same public interest at heart, I think is an important uh, initiative to consider. Um, and, I think, and I can't think of a better explanation um, to all of our city's elected officials, many of which have chose, have ran on the platforms, publicly elected officials ran on the platforms of being pro-police, making sure that the vested interests of the police um, are at the heart of, of, of why they, uh, of their you know, function within the city council. 30 I think seconds that, remaining. Um, I think that, that it's important to realize that this is, that this study has been done to make the work of policing, the, the important work of policing Oklahoma City citizens um, and its criminals a lot easier. Um, so keep it in mind, it's gonna be okay. There's a lot of people that, um, that can be judgmental about it um, and reactionary, but I think that, uh, uh, I'm out of time, but you Thank sort you of get what I'm saying. That. All right. okay. Appreciate you, thank you. Thank you. T. Cherie Dickerson, followed by Garland Pruitt. Good morning. T. Cherie Dickerson, resident of Ward 7. I don't remember if there's anything else I'm supposed to <laughs> acknowledge. Um, 
I first want to um, acknowledge that I was a member of the task force and it was a privilege to work with many of those that were so diligent in their effort to try to bring change and instill a different level of trust with community relations. They said to be brief. So in the interest of time, I'm asking the council to be expeditious in your approval and implementation of the recommendations. In the interest of time, be intentional and ever ready to listen to the impacted communities and heartbroken, grieving souls that continually have to make these petitions about saving lives. In the interest of time, be consistent in intentional calls for accountability and transparency within all systems, including law enforcement and municipal entities. In the interest of public relations, public safety, and simple humanity, fulfill your pledge and oath to protect and serve by respecting the humanity and value of human life. Understand the demand to stop killing us, the demand to simply see us and say that our lives matter, the demand to stop overwhelming our communities with unnecessary presence and abuse of power is simply saying that we deserve to be here. Respect the commitment of all the efforts and work given by task force and concerned community members who rendered their time and efforts without compensation. Because we are charged with the same call. We are charged with the purpose and we are charged with love for our communities, our families, and ourselves to truly be ones that try to protect and be of service to our communities. You've heard the names of loved ones who should still be among us because of and as the result of police violence, state sanctioned violence, and mistakes and misjudgments and simple racial bias. So please accept and approve the recommendations because in the interest of time is not a luxury that we can afford any longer. This process started almost two years ago with a list of demands. Now the demands come so that there are no added names to the list of stolen lives. The recommendations aren't perfect, we acknowledge that. There are many things that many of us wanted added and some that needed to be deleted. However, they are far better than what's being promoted as great de-escalation policy and flawed community interactions to where intentions and trust do not continue um, to be for the betterment of the community. They are ineffective and gross misuse of tax dollars, but simply they are also a waste of our time. Thank you. Arlen Pruitt. Garland will be followed by Whitney Blair. Good morning. Garland Pruitt, 952 North Triple X Road, Choctaw, Oklahoma. I was also a member of the task force. If you see that list of eight that you listed, the number one on that list was de-escalation. All of us have a responsibility and an obligation to look out for one another. You hold a title, you hold a position, you're in a position to fix change and make this world a better place for all of us. We can do this. I support the recommendations, all of them. My concern, my major concern is, how quick, fast, and a hurry can we implement them? How quick, fast, and a hurry can we hire someone to be in charge of the implementation? Two years later, we have recommendations and no policy on the books. That's my concern. How quick can we make that happen? How Soon can we hold those accountable in the positions that they hold accountable for the results of those recommendations? That's my concern. How soon will the applications go out to hire that person to hold that position? What are the qualifications for those that might hold that position? When can we get that done? 
the list, the short list was made, mentioned a little, a little while ago, of folks that have died at the hands of our officers. We're not anti-police. We're anti-injustice. Accountability is what we're after. That's what we're looking for. Hold us accountable. When we're charged with a crime, we fulfill that obligation. It's been made mention that the majority of those that are incarcerated, that are locked up in jail or in prison, has a mental issue. The mental issue is major. You don't kill a mental patient. You get them treatment. So today, I support, I recommend, I endorse all of the resolutions. Like you say, they're not perfect. There's always room for improvement. We can do this. You can do this. The community can do this. Let's save lives and make life better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Whitney Blair. Whitney Blair. OK, Jess Eddy. And Jess Eddy will be followed by Hannah Royce. What's the truth of the matter is that most of these guys standing right here have been in policing for decades. And these policies are things that they've known are what we should have done. But they have opposed it and not done it themselves. They've caused you all, the task force and this community, to endure hell, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to propose common sense solutions to existing problems. Those numbers, second deadliest in the nation over a span of 12 years. Preceding that, it was just as bad. But what has happened here is these political realities have hamstrung some of you on this council that I believe have the courage and character to do the right thing. Mayor Holt has betrayed you and he will betray you. That is a savvy political genius right there. He is uh, destroying the Republican base that he pretends to represent. You two, though, I looked into your backgrounds. You don't seem to be the rich. You were a police uh, emergency dispatcher. That to me sounds like an extremely difficult job. And I respect that you did that for our community. And I respect that you respect police and that you have a political reality that you need to support police. Councilman Carter, I saw your background in recovery and the loss of a family member. I too am in recovery and loss of family member. Those are the kinds of realities that take something more sensitive, more human, more pragmatic than this entity right here that is much more concerned about maintaining the current political power of the FOP than any lives in our community. Those guys murdered Stavian Rodriguez, shot a 15-year-old 20 times after he dropped his weapon, and because of the FOP, and this city, Kenny Jordan, have all the money and lawyers fighting plea deals, dragging it out, can't own up and accept that they made a mistake. 30 seconds, please. Cameo Hall and his mother lives in hell after her son was killed. She'll never get that moment back. Have the courage, and I tell you, the, the fist of solidarity from me, from the community that I'm with, will turn into the handshake of partnership. We can work together, but not with these malicious, incompetent morons who don't give a damn about people's lives. I'm talking to you, Wade Gurley, bitch. Hannah Royce, followed by J.B. Williams. Good morning. My name is Hannah Royce, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a resident of Ward 2. 
First, I think it's crucial we acknowledge the history of the lands we occupy today as it is significant and cannot be fully expressed here. But as our manholes around the city point out, this is a city created by the land run. It was, it was and is dominated by white people through the violence and oppression and often continued and enacted in the present via our police department. Council people, Mayor Holt, our city's response to that violence from this police department over the years has been strikingly insufficient. Today, it's a new day. It's the day, in fact. This is the opportunity to write Boomtown 2.0 with a new outlook and professional recommendations on how we, together, improve public safety and keep our communities safe for the next 10 plus years. I'm committed to the work. Are you? For the record, this is Ralph Ellison's birthday. He was pretty big on freeing ourselves from the limitations of today by getting acquainted with what went on in the past. I watched a large majority of the task force meetings via YouTube. Items discussed in those meetings are really the bare minimum. More specifically, it's the bare minimum for a department that receives 227 million of our dollars. The history as to why we need oversight is complicated in a lot of different ways, but ultimately, folks, we have oversight because things have gone wrong. This community needs and deserves constant dialogue about what we're doing to right those wrongs. We've got the opportunity to put our mouths where our money is, and our money is with the police department. Accepting these recommendations honors the work of the task force, the protesters, the lives lost, the working group, and so many more. When you heard Nicole speak of the names that were lost at the hands of our police department, that's the truth. Oklahoma City, we must believe in truth. Lesson number 10 in Timothy Snyder's book on tyranny is believe in truth. Snyder says to abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. He goes on to say, you submit to tyranny when you renounce the difference between what you want to hear and what seconds. is actually the case. 30 seconds. This yeah. renunciation of reality can feel natural and pleasant, but is the result but the result is your demise as an individual and thus the collapse of any political system that depends on individualism. Vote yes today, folks, and swiftly implement these items. History is watching, we are watching, and we're not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. A.B. Williams. A.B. Williams will be followed by Michael Washington. My name is uh, JV, and I live at on, in War 7. Uh, anyways, uh, everybody said some good stuff this morning. And, you know, a lot of people already said what I wanted to say. <laughs> but I think that it's important, and I think that we have a unique opportunity to show the community that y'all not morons. You know what I'm saying? And y'all not stupid um, by accepting these recommendations. Um, I've had several encounters with the police before, and I've had guns pulled on me before at age five, young, you know. Um, and I think a lot of the recommendations that he said today um, are even some of the things that, you know, Chief Gorley and I talked about in conversations that we had you know, um, about things that were broken and things need to be fixed. And, you know, I don't got all the answers. I don't think he had all the answers today, but I think that it's definitely a step in the right direction. And I think that we can show um, the community that we actually care about them and that their voice matters. And, you know, oftentimes we feel like we're just, the police are just used, at least where, I'm, where I come from, I feel like the police are just used to keep us in line. And whenever you have police come to a community that they aren't from, or they, they, they have a perception in their mind about this community 
that they've grown up and heard over the years, and then they're allowed to police that community. They have this perception about, you know, um, that's hard, you know what I'm saying? I had a, I, I, I remember there was a cop car two weeks ago, lights on in front of my house, and I'm, I'm leaving the gym, going home, and he's sitting in front of, one, one's in my driveway, one's in front of my car, and they, they got aggressive with me, like it was their house, you know what I'm saying? And I was just trying to go in. I said, you in my driveway, you know? Um, and so I think that if we can, you know, start to move in the right direction, then, you know, those things don't have to happen. I don't have to feel like I did something wrong when I'm pulling in my driveway, you know? I also want to say that any um, 30 seconds program, any youth program, any of the violence interruption programs, I'm willing to help, willing to be involved, willing to volunteer, whatever it takes to uh, fix the problems that we have in the city and help my community. So thank you. Thank you. Michael Washington, followed by Mark Nelson. Well, 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 my illustrious guest, and you harsh you premises. I can't get a little relaxed while I'm here. Now, this, what we fail to realize today is that we have a fraternal order of police are not going to allow us to go on. Let's keep it real if we're going to be trill today. Now, then, we know that the fraternal order of police have a collective bargaining agreement with you. If you will pass every one of these measures, We'll send our polices on strike against you. Don't start with Michael now, because Michael knows the facts of the case. Just the facts, sir. Now then, you heard what the gentleman said speaking, Mr. Brian Maxey. You people need help here in your police agency because you're so doomed in the believing that it's your way or the highway that it turns now the table on you. Because you got somebody from the outside saying you need help, that you're sick. Well, now then. I just hate I only got three minutes. Lord, have mercy, because three minutes I just get rolling around. Now then, you talked about number one, police de-escalation. Oh, no, that's one of our fine tunes. If we do that, we lose fun. We can't go home and brag to our friends and go take a drink and say, I killed that nigga the other night. That's right, y'all know I ain't going to bite my tongue in here. Y'all know that. I'm going to be different today. Everybody else says something illustrious, great thing, but wait just a minute. Hold on, Benny Edwards. You a black man. Don't you sell your, your flowers on our street. We'll kill you. Now hold it, boy. I'm going to shoot you in the back. Don't run from me, nigga. Sabian Rodriguez. Sabian, drop your weapon. Drop everything that's on you. Pop, 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 pop. Wait a minute. Didn't you tell him to drop his stuff? Why are you killing him? Why you want to shoot him 19 times? Oh, man, I'm not going to be nice to these people. For what? Do you show me and earn my nice that you're getting nothing from me, but how do you give it to me? And yet, let me explain to you. If one of them should need help, I'm going to be the first to come to the aid because I was raised and born by God to do so. I'll never let my enemy die. If I can help him out, the hell you mean do I have a problem with you shoot me down because I got a black skin, man? I don't need to go to New Mexico, Denver, and places like this here. Hello, Brianna Taylor. I already got my Robin Howards here. 30 seconds remaining. I got my Curtis Buff Williams here. This police agency, Ray Gurley, he sent them assassins in that jail and killed my black friend Curtis Buff Williams. Not once did they say, Curtis, drop a weapon. Let the hostage go. No. They walked in so calmly, so coolly, collectively, huh? With that gung ho says, all right, Bob, you ready? Let's kill that nigga up there. Boom, boom. Come on, man. In today's modern day society, you should ask a person like the man just suggested, hey, drop your weapon, whatever. No, none of that. I start a feast of baby because I will be back. Thank y'all. Nice to hear with it. Thank you. Mark Nelson. Mark Nelson, uh, FOP president, 1624 South Agnew. I just want to publicly and formally uh, address mayor, city manager, and council as it relates to these recommendations. Um, may be disappointing to some in the room, our position, um, that we are not opposed to what 21CP recommended in its entire format. We can easily 
recognize the value of, I would say, the overwhelming majority. Of course, we've looked at all 39 recommendations, and we probably have little input uh, or place to have input on most of them. Um, it's not a secret that some of these recommendations we don't agree with, but what we haven't done and will not do is dig our heels in, refuse to have discussions. Um, just last week, several members of our executive board were in training over two of the very specific issues in here, which relates to officers viewing their body camera prior to interviewing in critical incidents, and also to the, uh, the issue of when to interview, how soon after those critical incidents. So we continue to educate ourselves, uh, but I wanna publicly thank those of you who support and recognize the difficult task that police officers perform in this community every single day, the sacrifices that they make. Um, we're appreciative for the support, and as it relates to anything that will lessen deadly force encounters, of course we're supportive of that. I and mean, if we could have zero, we would be the loudest trumpeters of that outcome. Um, anything that promotes community safety, officer safety, of course we will do whatever we can to facilitate that. But we also recognize, and, and I want to let you know that our officers are committed, and, and this is a department FOP issue. I, I don't speak for the department, obviously. We have a chief that can do that very well. Um, but as it relates to the job that our members do and that our officers do, um, they're committed to public safety. And where we can improve, um, I've been on almost 21 years and have seen a lot of improvements, and hopefully there will be many more. We will be a partner in that. We will continue to have discussions. Negotiations is right around the corner for next year, so we look forward to that and will not shy away from any conversations that relates to any of these recommendations. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the people who signed up to speak on these items. So if there's any further comment from council now, just see the time. real quick, uh, Mark, thank you for coming down here today and speak. And I think every reasonable person realizes that the police officers are trying to achieve the same thing that was presented in this report. It's not like we're at odds against each other, and I appreciate your efforts to come down and, and present those ideas. And I especially appreciate uh, Chief Gorley and many of the citizens out in Ward 5 want to thank you and, and, and everyone in the department for the work that you're doing and send their best wishes to the entire department, and especially to Chief Gorley. And Mark, again, thank you. Uh, we think I believe this, that we all work, we can all accomplish much more when we work together and not in opposition with each other. So again, thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other comments on these items? All right, I'm going to move on if no one says anything. <laughs> Councilman Cooper? You don't have anything? OK. Um, thank you to everyone who, who spoke. Um, I've really struggled all weekend with what I'm going to say. Um, so I think this might be my last big public moment to speak to these sort of issues. I look forward to the next several years of implementing uh, these, uh, these items. And, and I say years because I'll just start there. Some of these things are going to involve changes in state law. J just be ready for that. It's going to take state law to change some of these things. And when you look at a place like Colorado, it took them a decade to make those sort of changes in state law. But as I heard Hannah Royce, Ward 2 resident, say, I'm committed to this work. I am with you for that work. And as I just heard Mark Nelson say, I'm committed to community safety. So I'm, let, this, is, this, 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 this nonsense needs to stop, this back and forth. People's lives are on the line, and that's what I heard people remind us today. We have a problem that I, I only heard a few people address, and I just am one of those people that believes that when we're dealing with issues, we gotta name the problem, why it's a problem, and then talk about the solution. So that's what I wanna do. And I wanna talk about 
For me, the number one problem that was so important, I'd literally left a job that just the year before <laughs> saw a raise. I'd been making around $35,000. And uh, then after the historic <laughs> teacher walkout in 2018, we got a raise. I went up to a little over 40. I'd never made anything like that in my life. Matt, who spoke earlier, I worked with Matt at the Olive Garden. I'm used to wages that are in the 20,000s. But I knew we had a problem and it was a crisis in public education. That's what I didn't hear enough of today. We, have, we face a crisis in public education and I have really bad news and then I'll have some good news. The bad news is all a simple Wikipedia search and I would encourage everyone in this room to go down this rabbit hole with me later. Do a Google search for American public education. And in that article, you will see that the very moment public education began in the American South was the very moment people worked to defund it. This crisis in education is not new. It is from its inception here in the South. It's from its inception. Now think about that for black folk. We just came out of Black History Month. Think about that. If slavery is something that begins from even before we're a country, and then at the end of the Civil War, for barely 10 years with the, end, the ending of slavery with the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment granting citizenship, the 15th giving black men, black men, not women, the right to vote. If from the moment we did that, and then we tried to do public education, and then immediately, Southern politicians said no to public education. Immediately they did that. And then they undid efforts to rebuild the South, which had been destroyed by war, this period of reconstruction. And for 100 years since, from 1865 until 1965, no black person could vote and serve in a legislative body. 100 years. A hundred years. And during that time, we didn't fund properly the schools. We didn't do that. We did not do that. And it took until the Voting Rights Act before black folk, men and women, had the right to vote. There is a reason why Councilwoman Nice is only the second woman who is black to serve on this city council. And it is the history I just gave you. There is a reason why I have the honor. That's right, no, that's worth an applause. That's worth an applause. That's worth an applause. That's worth an applause because it speaks to our progress as creating a more perfect union. We cannot just sit here in despair. There is so much good in these recommendations, but sometimes we have to talk about the trauma before we can get to the cure, okay? There's a reason why I am only, only the first biracial or black person to serve on the city council outside of Ward 7 where the Honorable Nikki Nice serves. And it's through a history of segregation. That's true. But today, not only do I want to speak to that history, but I'd like to speak very specifically to my students. I have three who are on my mind. And I hope you'll keep them in mind over the next years ahead of us with this work. First is Evelyn. You know that when I quit my job at Jefferson Middle School, I was teaching college preparation. We focused on five skills, strengthening reading, writing, group work, organization, and critical thinking skills. Why did we do that? Because when you go to Oklahoma Watch from July 29, 2015, you will see that statewide graduations had dropped in all student groups. In fact, uh, barely 82% of our students 84, excuse me, had graduated in 2013, 2014. And those numbers get worse once you start looking at our black students, our Hispanic Latinx students, our students from poverty, our students who have English as a second language. And so nationwide, we created this wonderful program that OKCPS invested in called AVID to create a support system for our students because so many of our students at Jefferson and all across this city, so many of them when they go home, rather than being able to do homework, they are 
helping to raise their cousins and their little brothers and sisters. That's what they're doing. And so it's hard for them to focus on public education, their school, because they have a commitment to their families. That's true. So what AVID did was we created that support system within the school. And I quit my job because I realized that if I could be the next council person for Ward 2, I could create that support system for them after school as well. And those are the youth centers. That's the good news I'd want you to leave here today. I know there are 39 recommendations right here that are going to help uh, interrupt cycles of crime. I'm interested in prevention. And we can prevent these things by making sure our kids have a support system after school, on breaks, and that's what the youth centers will do. And so anybody who truly believes in prevention, as I heard many of you say today, it's time for you to connect with the MAPS for program director. It is time for you to connect to your council person and say that you have kids in your schools that have ideas on what should go in these youth centers, like mental health access care, like life skills, like recreation. And that takes me to my next student, Daniel. I mentioned Evelyn because last semester when I was teaching at ECO and I went to go refill my water bottle, I heard Mr. Cooper. Now the college students don't call me Mr. Cooper. They call me James, changes. I heard Mr. Cooper and I turned around and I saw Evelyn. The college program worked. The college prep program worked. Evelyn is now in college because we provided a support system. I've been doing this work since 2015, teaching in our schools. I know what our kids need, and they need a support system. They need community care. Because if we don't provide that for them, they will end up being the ones caught in a cycle of generational poverty and cyclical crime. And they will be the ones finding themselves on the wrong side of a bullet. That's why you will never hear me refer to any person who commits a crime as a criminal, because they are a human being with the backstory. And we have an opportunity, not at X, Y, and Z, which is where these recommendations come from. We have an opportunity at A, B, and C to invest in our kids from birth onward, and we don't and we haven't, and we haven't since the Civil War. Again, enjoy Wikipedia, and then go do some real research. So look, Daniel was a second student. He helped me shape the youth centers in MAPS 4. He actually literally called me to say, Mr. Cooper, here's what I think we should put in those youth centers. And that was the language I used to craft the youth centers with this council. The third student is Fernando. Fernando shocked everybody one day in my avid college preparation class, and he's probably about to shock some of you in this room, probably all of you, I think. I always ask students, what do you want to do to, make, to, to wake up in the morning? What is your happiness? What will you wake up and say, I'm grateful that I'm doing this work? They had all kinds of answers, but Fernando's is the one I'll share with you today. Fernando said he wanted to be law enforcement. And the rest of that class looked at him with some side eyes like, you'll never know. And I said, no, 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 let's hear him out. And he said, echoes of what you heard in this room today, he said, Fernando said, that it was time for officers to live in their neighborhoods that they're sworn to serve and protect. And he wanted to be that sort of officer. Well, that is why of the six recommendations I put forward in the resolution, that is why I said that officers should have access to mental health services 24 seven and they should be discreet. Because if Fernando does go on to become a law enforcement officer and he experiences, encounters the traumas that we are number one in the state for experiencing for our children, number one in trauma statistics, number one in neglect, abuse, you name it, number one in adverse childhood experiences. So if Fernando encounters one of those folks, I suspect it's gonna hurt him too. 
and we need to make sure he's on a quick road to recovery to mitigate the harm that is in his brain. Because as you heard earlier, hurt people hurt people. And we can't have that. Those days must be done. That's also why, because of those high trauma statistics, the second thing we put in there was to say that every officer should have, should not just have, but should receive training in crisis intervention because they never know who they're gonna encounter out there. And if we live in a state with the highest trauma statistics in the country, then chances are they're about to encounter someone experiencing a trauma and acting out of desperation. And so that means we must prepare our officers for that work. And that means they have to understand how to interact with people experiencing mental health issues. It's just this easy. And then we went further for number three and we said that there should be an alternative response to mental health calls. Law enforcement has not been completely, they didn't go to school for mental health training and neither did I as a teacher. But you know, as a teacher, I was asked every day to work with students in mental health care crisis. And that's because we've defunded and fought again since the Civil War to fund public education properly. And you put mental health care right there beside it. We didn't fund that properly either. And you put it on the shoulders of law enforcement and you put it on the shoulders of teachers, this mental health care. It's time that we let trained mental health professionals respond to those experiencing mental health crisis. And that is one of the recommendations right here that not only will we approve today, but we've already set aside $300,000 as an upfront investment in it. I want that to go further because Denver already went from 200,000 for their program to 1.4 million. Okay, see, are we, are we number one or what? Let's do it. Um, we also said several other things there, but I'm gonna conclude because I've spoke for so long and I'd hate for you to forget my emphasis here, which was public education and our students and the work that I have committed to doing for Evelyn, Fernando, and Daniel, and the work I will always do for them. When I was a child, one of the most horrifying experiences embedded in my brain remains, and I don't talk about it often, but it remains watching my father enact domestic abuse on my mother. That's already horrific, but more horrific is calling the cops on your dad. And that's what I did as a 10 year old. As you heard me say earlier, I am biracial. These freckles are honest. It really hurt to call law enforcement on my father who is black and from a place called Little Dixie, the southeast part of this state. What if there had been an alternative response to mental health calls? What if Palomar and domestic violence services had existed? What if I had been able to call someone who is trained in domestic violence to respond to that call that day? I had have called that number and my mother wouldn't have stayed in a loveless, abusive marriage for the next decade of her life for no other reason than she says to protect me and my sister. So this work is deeply personal to me, not just as a teacher, but as a biracial Oklahoman. And those of you who know LGBT history know that it is very strange that I'm in this seat. Because for a long time, police brutality was synonymous with LGBT history. I think we're in a better day. But how long we stay in that better day is up to us because that period of reconstruction after the Civil War barely lasted 10 years before it all fell apart. And how long we keep this progress will depend on all of us. That is my speech and I have a couple questions. I didn't even write that. Um, oh, thank you, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. Thank Daniel and Evelyn and Fernando, or get mad at them if you didn't like hearing me speak. Uh, Craig, a couple questions for you. One is um, Paula Sophia, who I wanna thank, uh, former law enforcement, current social worker. She's the one who introduced me to what community policing is. Um, 
she would very much like to speak with Ganesha as a follow-up. Um, somewhere along the way that fell apart and she's very interested in making sure uh, members of our uh, trans community and our uh, two-spirit community um, have a chance to kind of have a vulnerable space to share kind of what you heard earlier with Brian say, like make sure that from the community there's that conversation about what that history is of why there is, uh, you know, maybe a lack of trust there, but how they can build something together. So that was something I heard. Um, Two, it, well, no, that's the most important one. And then I'll just say some thanks. I wanna say thank you to Paula. I wanna say thank you to Corey Lynn Hall. She's the one who really put it in my head that we could have an alternative response to mental health calls. Councilwoman Hammond, you have educated me so much on violence and eruption programs, and I am very thankful for that. Uh, Councilwoman Nice, you made sure that our youth programs we're a part of this recommendation, and I really want to thank you for that. So I think people like Fernando thank you for that. And you've also just been such a, such a friend to me during this time. Thank you to everyone who worked on this task force. And um, if those of you out there are finding yourself, again, bored with how long I'm speaking, I'm doing it because LGBT history and black history tend to find themselves erased. I would really hate, I would hate for history to erase the contributions Ward 2 made to this moment. I'd really hate that, and I won't let that happen. So thank you for listening. Any, any other comments or questions from council on these items? Yes, I yeah. do have a few comments I'd like to make. Um, I, um, I struggle with this concept that we're not at odds, um, because I think we are at odds. Um, I think since 2020, this community has been having, trying to have a conversation about public safety that has been dominated by the idea that uh, we are a dangerous city with dangerous people in it, and the solution uh, has to be to um, to disappear those people that are dangerous to us. Um, I hear a lot of stories being somebody that um, is publicly discussing police accountability, alternatives to policing. People end up sending me a lot of stories about their experiences of our police department. Um, and it's really hard to read them because at the end of the day, um, we can point to policies we have, we can point to X, Y, Z, but there's not really a lot of accountability to ensure that the people who are um, doing this damage to our community um, are truly held accountable and not in a way of, oh yeah, they need to go get locked up, but that they should not be in positions of power where they can abuse that power. Um, most well, not even most recently, but recently. Uh, this wasn't even directed at me, um, but I saw it on Twitter. Um, one resident of our city uh, said that they started their Sunday morning watching police say to people who were next door, he was, this person was out on, on their porch apparently and was hearing police say things like, I will kill you right now without hesitation. I won't lose a bit of sleep. If you mouth off to me again, I'll knock your ass off the patio. Don't you just want to shoot them when they are like that? This person was talking about some squatters that sound like they are staying in the house next door. And I would say that is a conversation where two entities are at odds. Are, are those pe folks doing something that is considered illegal in our society? Yes. Do we know all of the dynamics that led them to be there? We could probably guess at some of them, but we don't know. And that kind of approach to addressing people was met with by supervisors, apparently. Well, sometimes you just have to talk harshly to transients. I would call that being at odds. So I struggle with this idea that we aren't at odds because 
because we just frankly are. It is disingenuous to say that we are hashtag one OKC um, and not support accountability for people with power that abuse it. It is disingenuous to say we are hashtag one OKC and not push for funding for the things that we know can help people be safe. And I do, and I want to address that even talking, I mean, go beyond mental health, the criminalization of mental illness where we just for decades decided, well, we don't have anyone to respond to these crises, so we'll just have police do it. Um, that has led to the criminalization of mental illness and the idea that people with mental illness are automatically, or maybe not automatically, but by and large dangerous, which is statistically not true. When I receive, when I say something publicly about police accountability and I receive messages from police officers saying, well, I'll take you out and show you how your homeless are. Assuming again that they are less than, that they are violent, that they are not dehumanizing people. That is being at odds. And so I do, I want to address the piece about violence because this idea that the sort of core notion of policing is that there are, or at least the way that we have done it in America, um, is that there are some bad people and they need to be removed from the community. But what we know about violence is that it's not just individuals being bad. People are put in situations, contexts where, where they are, where they are influenced and in many ways reach a breaking point. They are not mostly random acts. They are, there's a very obvious trajectory of leading to the, those sorts of violence. And I said this during a meeting, I read some of this during a meeting two, almost two years ago now, but I think it's worth revisiting in this moment because for people in my ward that come to me and ask about gun violence, about murder, about how they can keep their neighborhoods safe from gang violence, from, from youth getting their hands on guns and harming one another, I think that there are answers and some of those are in this, these recommendations and they aren't, we need more patrols of police officers. They aren't, um, we need uh, to give police more power to remove people from a community. Um, and so I'm just gonna read from Daniel Sered's um, uh, report, white paper about violence and about alternatives, or I, I, I'm, and I'm sick, sick of the word alternative. I'm gonna say proper responses to violence because she, mentioned, she specifically says, most violence is not a matter of individual pathology. It is created. Poverty drives violence, inequity drives violence, lack of opportunity drives violence, shame and isolation drive violence. And like so many conditions known all too well to public health professionals, violence itself drives violence. In the US, many policies have in fact nurtured violence by exacerbating the very things that drive it, including poverty, instability, substandard education, and insufficient housing. One can look at massive growing investments in law enforcement at a time when public education and healthcare systems are struggling to meet basic needs. One can look at union busting, food deserts, and predatory lending. These problems are compounded by limited and broken ideas of manhood that equate strength with wealth and violence in places where wealth is almost completely unattainable, but violence is an option at every turn. And these are the stories I hear of young people feeling like they have no other options, no one to go to, and what makes them feel like a man is access to a gun and wielding that gun against others, using their fists, using what tools they have been given because our society has decided that they are less than worthy of investment in the things that Councilperson Cooper mentioned. And so I just, I want, I wasn't gonna say anything because I feel like I've said it all before, but this, this idea that we aren't at odds, I just, I have to address that because when accountability measures are held hostage for more funding, that's being at odds. Like, there's just no other way to say it. And I'm open to conversation, I'm open to working together, 
but unfortunately, the things that we really need investment in are const consistently deprioritized because we have this sense that people out in our community are dangerous and need to be dealt with in a way that we have been doing already for so long and we know hasn't been working. So I also want to echo thanks to all the working group members, the task force members who worked on this because I'm tired. <laughs> I can't imagine uh, the volunteer time they put in to learn, to express their input with the like hope that something will be done. And I think, you know, I, I am, you know, in this, in the conversation about accountability and about who is ultimately responsible for implementation of these things is the council is, we are. And if we let that slip, we've really done a disservice to all of the work of, that's gone into this. And I feel like the community has watched this process happen of crisis moment, let's sign a task force, let's get some recommendations and have them sit on a shelf. And, and I really, really hope that we will prioritize the implementation of these. And I appreciate the city manager's commitment to that. Um, and I really hope that as a community, we can hold, you can hold us accountable to that um, and that we can hold ourselves accountable to that because we've just been doing the same thing for too long and it's just not working. I actually agree with you and it doesn't happen too often, I know, but we are at odds in a lot of ways. I've sat here and I've listened to how we feel how we need to follow truth, we need to go back and forth, follow the science, follow this. And I am just as equally disappointed in the fact that there wasn't one person that stood up to say one positive thing about our law enforcement or anything that does go on in our community. And I've received numerous calls and emails of how I better vote on this and what I better do to represent my ward and how I better go this way or that way. But yet not one person showed up to back that up. And for that, guys, I'm sorry. I can tell you, though, when I ran last year, I had one door shut on me. And every other single person said, I better back my police officers. And I knocked over 8,000 doors. Every officer that I've talked to wants to hold each other and themselves accountable. They're not trying to shy away from accountability. I've heard it echoed numerous times through our police officers that the person who hates a dirty cop the most or a bad cop is the cop standing next to them. They don't like to be classified in that, in that area. Our feelings are going to lie to us numerous times. Our experiences are, are what they are. Facts don't, data doesn't. But yet, at the beginning of our, our presentation of this 21 CP solutions thing, they, they said that we wanted to hear the community voices. And so we did the surveys. We didn't look at the cases. So we didn't pull data. We just made phone calls. I don't think that that's very fair. That doesn't really give us a very good actual program to go off of or look at or any of these recommendations for that matter. Not that some of these recommendations aren't good. I also find it interesting that a lot of these recommendations we're already doing, but we haven't talked about that yet either. Chief Corley came on in July of 2019. By the end of 2019, early 2020, he was already working and talking about implementing mental health professionals or people that could actually help with de-escalation before it ever even became a topic in our city. But we haven't talked about that. Last year, we had 872,414 contacts between our community and our police officers. Of that, 528 of them had uses of force. That's 0.06%. 11 of them resulted in the officer having to discharge the firearm. Out of that 11, six were fatal. But yet we had 90 
homicides last year for citizen to citizen murders. Our officers aren't supposed to be counselors. They're not having to be respectful just because they show up. Their job is to enforce the law and to protect and, and provide us that aspect of security. If they step out of line, we hold them accountable. We've gotten numerous cases and we have executive sessions and different things where we've had to do that. We're not perfect. We make mistakes just like they do, just like everyone else does, and that's what puts them in usually contact with these police officers. This seems extremely lopsided to me. I don't think that we, we show any aspect of appreciation when we don't have a true fact-finding thing. We just want to make phone calls. If all we do is base stuff off of feelings, we're going to be misguided every single time. Follow the data, follow your science. Let's look at the facts. I'll stop with that. I've got a couple things. I'm just going to go through some of the notes that I wrote down as we listen to our citizens you know, come and speak to us today and to talk about some of the things that they have been led to believe. And I think that it is very concerning to me. For example, we had one resident come up and describe a situation where we had a non-police response. IMSA responded to a mental health crisis. The police were responded after that individual was in the care of IMSA, which is what we're talking about doing with one of these recommendations. And that citizen felt like that was the wrong thing to have happen. Now, maybe our officers could have handled it a little differently in some of the conversations that they had publicly that made that citizen feel part of that way. And I, I know that the chief's going to take care of that. But if our citizens are already feeling like that is not the appropriate response, then how are we to implement that recommendation if we're not doing a good job of communicating that's already what we're doing? The next thing, um, and Councilman Carter spoke to it, is that there are a number of these recommendations that started well before 21CP came on, well before any of the riots or the the interactions that occurred in 2020, so many things had already started ahead of that. And I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like some of those things might have even started before Chief Gorley just a little bit in the process of doing that because Chief Gorley didn't show up in July of 2019 and go, oh, you know what? Let me fix something I just figured out. He knew those things were happening and he started having conversations with command staff and in his position before as well as our other command staff and taking those things into consider, excuse me, into consideration. We had another resident um, and several others that said kill less residents and what I would say to you is that applies to everybody, to Councilman Carter's statistics and the numbers. Our officers are out there to help protect our residents from other residents um, and we we want everybody to go home safe at night. We want our citizens to live safely at night. We want our officers to go home safely at night. And we need to support them in order to do that. One of the other things I heard said was that we don't need more patrols. And my concern with that is that it feels a little hypocritical when we say we want more police and community interaction that is positive, but we're not going to have enough officers out there on the street to have those kind of positive interactions. You know, when we see Facebook posts of our police officers uh, playing basketball with kids or going out and playing, um, you know, tossing a ball, whatever the case may be with the kids in their communities, if we had staffing at the levels that is safe for our officers and safe for our community, then we would be able to have more of those positive interactions where our police officers are getting to know the citizens in the areas that they patrol, not just having to respond in crisis situations um, or to calls in that 
for police involvement. Um, that community engagement piece requires that the community be engaged. I know and I have heard and I have seen how sometimes that community engagement piece is only in those crisis situations. I invite the community, and I know that our police officers invite the community to engage with them in a number of different ways, not just with the youth, but with community involvement activities and events that they put on on a very regular basis where you know, a very small number of people show up to, to get to know our officers. So the community has to be involved in this as well. We can say all we want to from the horseshoe and our officers can come up to the podium and say everything they want to, but we have to invite the community out to do that and to show up for part of that so we are all in this together. Um, I've heard from many citizens and from many council members about how truth is important. We've seen the media take into consideration information that is not factual, just in the hearing of these two items today, the information that the Oklahoma put out and that the news stations picked up was inaccurate. And there was no attempt, to my knowledge, of making sure that the information that they were sharing with city residents was accurate. Well, what kind of job is that doing for our citizens? That's not helping. There's supposed to be another partner in improving the process. And maybe I'm idealistic in the whole idea of it and potentially naive, I'll own it. I want a better world. We all have to be a part of making that possible. And if the, we're just going to continue to spew inaccuracies and not care whether it's true or not, that's a problem. Um, when it comes to youth programs, and I'll kind of, um, I've got this and one more. Youth programs are so important, and our department does a number of them already today. And so seeing that as a recommendation, and I believe that there's a line in there that says that we're already doing this day, um, I would encourage our residents and our citizens and everybody here today to encourage youth to be involved. There is a lot of discouraging youth to be involved in law enforcement um, education and activities and that sort of thing. So, I mean, if we want to make a change in the world, the two things you got to do is you got to teach the kids that cops aren't bad because they're not all bad. And you've got to teach the kids that um, the Oklahoma City Police Department is hiring and we need, we need applicants from every part of the city, of every shape, size, color, orientation. And we need you to apply. We need you to be engaged. And we need you to be a part of the change in the world. And then the last thing that I will say is that when we talk about sending mental health response to calls, and I will, I will say this until the end of time, we have to ensure the safety of the mental health professional. When we have mental health professionals serving on this council who have yet to spend time on a ride along with the police department when they've been invited to do so on a number of occasions, what kind of message is that sending to the mental health community? I think you have to toe the line, you have to go out there and show them that it is the right thing to do and being a part of the solution is seeing it from both sides. And I would encourage you to do that. I know many officers would be happy to take you and CIT, HOT team, the whole nine yards. I think it's super important to really be open to that. And you know, we are at odds. We know that. That's a fact. There's no, there's no denying it but coming from the background that I have and the experience that I have with mental health services as a patient, as a daughter, as a wife, and as a mother, and all of the mental health interactions that I have had in each one of those roles, it is important to get mental health services to our community, and we do a horrible job of that today. We have to be careful about what role we take on, take away from the state, um, in doing that because there are state laws that tie our hands and we have to be careful and make sure our mental health professionals are protected and safe when they go out there to help our residents. It's a difficult line to toe. I think we agree on that. And so I hope that at some point, someday, before the next election in 2025 for me, that you and I can come to a place where we can really get together on a lot of these things because I think that there is more that we agree on than we disagree on.
That's all I've got. Just I'd like to add a, a couple, couple things. Could I? Oh, please, you haven't spoken. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brian, you still there? Can't see you, but um, I want to thank you for this report. Uh, ever since I got a copy of it, I have spent a lot of time with it. I've marked it up. I've, I got note cards. Um, I've learned a lot from it. There are some things that I strongly disagree in it. I just have to be honest with you. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are two areas that are really important to me uh, that I saw uh, from the report. Um, first of all, I learned that we already have 1,429 pages for de-escalation in policy and training. I learned that we have over 626 pages of operators' manuals. And so we, we've got all this paperwork uh, where we've invested time putting things down on paper, but the reality, reality is, is what are we doing? What are we accomplishing? And um, I think if you, if, if you spend some time with the report, and I have, I've looked at the footnotes and I've copied stuff and I've read it, um, if you look at pages 16 through 28, and you look at pages 77 through 85, those are the really important things that jump out at me. And I first want to talk about 77 through 85 because that kind of goes to what James said with Colorado and it taking 10 years because it talks about timelines. And then more importantly, it talks about barriers to accomplishing our goals. Um, but second, uh, this really jumped out at me, and that's pages 16 through 28 where it talked about recent efforts in the evolution. And I think you meant by that, Brian, that um, we are doing certain things right, and, 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 and we are evolving. And, and at page 20, it says, the OKCPD has a strong de-escalation policy, which is mandatory. And then there's a but, you know, we, we, we need to do more. And so I, the way I view this is that we have, um, we have a strong police force. We have uh, great leadership in our chief. And so I've, I've reached out to the chief and talked to him about this. I've reached out to Mark Nelson and talked to him about it. I've reached out to Craig Freeman and talked to him about it. And, and the one thing I've learned from all of this is, and, and, and I want the public to understand this, and I more importantly want the press to understand this, that we have not just sat by idly and done nothing. Since 2019, when Chief Gorley took over, we have made 42 major changes. And, and, and while we may have 1,429 pages as to de-escalation, we've done some great work in the area. We, we changed our mission statement. We changed our core values. We changed our vision statement, something that hadn't been done since 1990. And why that's important is to get the message out to our city as to what we're doing and get the message out to our law enforcement officers on what we're trying to accomplish. And so I, I think just to say um, that we need to start, we started. And we've started uh, prior to 2019, but we have new use of force policy updates. We no longer have chokeholds. We have security of life directives. We have a, a complete rewrite of our 170 disciplinary action. I think if you look at the Chief's Directives 2012, 2102, 2103, 2106, the mission statement, the core values, and the vision statement, I think you'll see that we are doing things to make this a great city. Um, one of the things that's in the report, uh, it talks about uh, what, what, what they're doing in, in Baltimore and what they're doing in Seattle and what they're doing in Cleveland. I don't want to do what Baltimore's doing. I don't want to do what Cleveland's doing. I don't want to do what Seattle's doing. I want to do what's best for Oklahoma City. And I think we have a plan. And after talking with Chief Gorley, I asked him to send me something. And I hope the press gets a copy of this. And that's 42 changes that we've made since July 2019 to present. And at this time, I'd like Chief Gorley to get up and to tell us about some of those changes, number one. But number two, more importantly, how this report will be helpful and beneficial to all of us, please. Thank you, Councilman Stone Cipher and uh, uh, Council and Mayor, City Manager. Um, I, I want to start too, though, just by uh, thanking everyone that was involved in the task force in the community policing group um, with 21 CP as well and. For us as a command staff, those that are here today, I really want to thank all of them. 
uh, for being here and, and uh, taking time out of their very busy schedules because it's important uh, and it's important to them, it's important to all of us. But the, to, to look at what occurred out of this process um, for all of us that we've discussed is that opportunity to sit back and listen but also be heard a little bit too. But for most of um, all of these task force meetings, the community policings, we sat and listened. And we didn't sit back and just say, you know, um, let's wait until this report comes out. Let's see what happens and what we need to do. We knew where we needed to go. We knew what we needed to do. We have a lot of experience um, in these matters and in law enforcement in general. And we knew that society had changed. And not only that, law enforcement has changed over the last several years, but more importantly, I was thinking today as I was getting ready for work, I started this job 32 years ago, and I was thinking of what I was taught in the academy and what I was taught then that is still taught today, and it's almost nothing. Um, and that shows you how that evolution is. That's a good thing. You have to adapt over your career in, in what you're doing, how you do it, um, why you do it. And, and I think that's what we've learned through all of this, but it's also in, in a reflective uh, matter, but it's also too what we've realized is that moving forward, you know, this place is gonna be around for another 32 years beyond when I'm here. And we're setting the stage for those folks that are coming up through the ranks now to show them this is how law enforcement works. We have to evolve, we have to change. And so I'm glad you mentioned um, the changes that are in there. And, and I won't go through, you know, all of them necessarily, but, but just mostly to kind of talk about the concept of it. And the, and the first thing that was very important to us that you did mention was the core values, the vision and mission statement. What you have to do in any organization, especially if you're changing the culture and what you're trying to do and communicate, is you have to have your people on board, not only for what that mission is, but where those lines are and what those core values are. And anything that we do, um, whether the officers do something great or they fall short in some areas, you wanna be able to tie that to a core value. And that's why that was so important to all of us within the organization. And those core values don't just apply to uniform staff, but to our non-sworn professional civilian staff that we have as well. We want everybody on the end of the department on the same page and to be able to say when we, when we do something well, there's a core value that we honored, you know, and sometimes multiple core values. And that's part of that. And that vision and mission statement too is just, you know, letting people know what, what's important, what we do as an organization, and making sure that it's short and concise. And, I, and those mission, the, the mission statement includes the core values as well. So that shows you how important that is. Um, use of force policy updates, that's something that we do continually. We have a policy review committee that my command staff um, uh, and attorneys sit on regularly because we're constantly reviewing, reviewing our procedures. And I credit a lot of that to uh, our planning and research staff who not only constantly look at our procedures and what we're doing, but in comparison and our accreditation through CALEA is very important too. And that helps keeps our policies and procedures up, up to date. But some of the biggest things I think um, that I will focus on out of that list is how we view leadership. And that was a priority uh, from the start is our, our leadership training has changed immensely because if you want Good people, um, they have to be led by good people as well. And so if you want them out there doing a good job and, and being held to those standards, that's probably the, one of the biggest changes we've made in the organization in regard to leadership is training. We get leadership training every year at all levels. We go through the same training. Most recently uh, through a, a company called Magnus, um, we've been conducting leadership training not only for formal leaders, people of rank, which you think of lieutenants and above, but we're, we're in the process right now of putting what we consider informal leaders throughout the department um, through the same training. And what that's done is, is it's not only held us accountable to what we're being taught, but it teaches them those same kind of principles too, that they can work with each other to help recognize when something's not going well on their shift, that they have just as much of an obligation to step in and do that. And I, I used the term informal leaders that I caught myself doing and actually through this program, uh, we've learned something that there are no informal leaders, there's only leaders. Everybody can be a leader in whatever position they're in. So that's been very important, but probably um, uh, again, I wanna focus on with, with uh, this list is the very first thing, which was officer wellness. Um, I really believe uh, when I took this job and it was, it was nothing intentional, but just based on my observance, that we were treating wellness as a box we checked and we weren't really committed to it 
and doing what we needed to do. And so um, as part of that, we really focused on wellness. We brought in a consulting group because I have no background in uh, um, you know, being a mental health counselor or anything like that. I don't, I don't know how to do that. And I really didn't have anybody on my staff that did either. So we hired a consulting group to come in um, and I was really pleased with what 21CP brought up with that, that, that they really liked what they saw in that consulting group. And we've implemented almost everything in there um, and really made a focus on wellness and focused a lot on it, uh, put a lot of resources into it. We went from one full-time staff member um, to now we have four and we have a large uh, contingent of volunteers that help throughout the department. We're getting ready to hire our first licensed professional counselor to have on staff, uh, something we've never had before. We're getting ready to hire a chaplain um, that will be someone that's outside of the police department, not a uniformed person that's just stepping in that, into that role. So with all of that and with those things, um, just to kind of comment again and go to what 21CP uh, has done and what this process has done is I feel like number one, um, it's helped us to listen, but number two, it's helped us to see that some of the things that we're doing, we're already headed in the right direction, so that validation is good. And then number three, that we can always improve. And I've said that from the start as a, uh, um, uh, as a chief of this organization, but as a police officer too, if you're not looking at what you're doing and finding ways to improve, then you're failing. And that's where our debriefing culture comes in and other things that we do. And so um, I just appreciate the opportunity to come up and say a few words. You know, I want to say uh, too, Will Rogers. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You go ahead. Will Rogers once said that uh, your train may be on the right track, but if you're not moving forward, you're going to get run over. And so, um, our latest citizen survey said that around 85% approve of this city as a great place to live, a, a great place to work, a, a great place to raise your kids. I, I think the important thing is we need to keep the train on the track and we need to keep it moving forward. And we're always open to improving and becoming better. And that's what makes Oklahoma City great. And I appreciate all your work and thank you for all, all, all you do for us. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge too, I appreciate Chief Gorley and his, uh, he takes a lot of shots and he has responsibility for the whole department. So when someone makes a mistake or does something wrong, he takes responsibility and stands up to it. But I appreciate his leadership because he's committed to this. He was looking at making changes and making improvements before we engaged 21CP, before we had issues going on. And, and I think it's that culture and that, that, um, that view of always looking to be better and always looking at what we're doing to be better in the community. I think he's really bought into that. He's participated in this entire process and been a part of that and is supportive of moving forward to these recommendations. Along the line, I think there's going to be disagreement with a lot of different people on exactly how we implement each individual piece and we'll work through those things, but it's something we have to do together. If we want to see things and see ourselves be better, it's something we all have to work together and do this together. And so I appreciate his leadership and his team um, in doing this, I, I, I want to, you know, I want to express that in, when we look at these kinds of things and we talk about police reforms and we talk about improvements we want to make, sometimes people can get the idea that we don't support our officers, but we do. We're grateful for the men and women of the department that are out there. We do know that we have to be accountable because of the significant responsibility that they carry and the authority that they carry. And so all of us together have to work together to see this move forward. And Chief's a huge part of this. And, it's, and, and like you said, they haven't been sitting still as we've gone through this. They've listened. They've, they've paid attention to what was going on. They've made changes even as we were making recommendations. And um, so he's been a part of this and been supportive of this. And I appreciate his work in that and his leadership. And it's going to be important as we go forward. Thanks, Chief. Thank um, I, I do, I, I feel compelled to just add a couple more things. Um, one is Councilman Stone Cipher, I really appreciate your comments. I'm glad that you added what you did. I know that sometimes ideologically you and I are, uh, we can find ourselves in philosophical disagreements, but boy howdy, when we agree, it's kind of fun. Um, so today was one of those moments. Um, and then, you know, I just heard from two of our newest council members um, some concerns, and I can only ask both of you, trust me, Trust the people who were on this task force for the last two years, including fellow council members. Trust what we just heard the chief say. Trust us. Trust us in this work. I just heard one of, one of my fellow council members mention the idea of like, ride-alongs. Councilwoman, I've gone on at my request and before 
before what happened to George Floyd, two ride-alongs, once with Hefner, again with Spring Lake, at my request and with thank you for always coordinating. You know, the chief has always been so responsive to me whenever I've reached out about the trainings. I've done trauma-informed trainings, reality-based trainings, which Councilman Stonecipher set up. Um, I have gone to the lineups <laughs> at the start. I believe I'm the first council person to do that. Um, I've sat in those cars for hours and listened to our officers. This resolution is the result of those ride-alongs, of the town halls. It's the result of the city council meetings. Like, I didn't just make this up. Um, that's not what an English composition and research professor does. Um, <laughs> and when I hear you concerned about the statistics and the data, um, well, I have some good news, and I'm happy to forward this to you. Penn Medicine has done research. Harvard, Yale, Drexel, The Washington Post, Mapping Police Violence, and Mapping Police Violence, Red Frontier verified every single one, every single one of those use of force incidents. Mapping Police Violence was correct. We are number two. That's not an opinion. That's not feelings. Those are facts, and facts matter. And I'm really, really sad that those are our facts, but I just believe we can do better. You know how I know that? Because to both Councilman Stonecipher and to each of your points, several of these recommendations are building on what we were already doing, the officer mental health wellness, the youth programs. In fact, for some reason, I keep thinking of Councilman Stone, and I, I always associate you with PAL and FACT. I do. And we're building on that in this resolution. So, just for we're the love of- We're already doing it, so why do we need 21 CP? Because we are number two, and I want us to be only held to the highest standard, and I know we are heading in that direction. And we weren't doing an alternative response to mental health care calls yet. We didn't have a violence interruption program yet. We did, we, almost 24% of our officers receive the crisis intervention training. This resolution asked to prepare all 100% of our officers all of them. So we are the gold standard, and we are protecting them when they go out to serve and protect. And we are protecting our residents so they know what they're getting. We were already heading in the right direction, but we can do better. We must do better. It is literally the framing of this Constitution and Declaration, which again, I took the oath on at my recommendation, to create a more perfect union a more perfect union. You just heard the chief, you just heard Craig Freeman as our city manager, you just heard Councilman Stonecipher say, we can always do better. And our students are asking us to do better. And by the grace of God, we will do better. Like, why would we not want to do better? Why would we miss this opportunity? To miss this opportunity is to put our head in the sand. I'm sorry if I'm exacerbated about this, but I am two years tired, and I know law enforcement is, I know the protesters are, I know city manager, I know you're tired. I'm tired, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm saying for the love of God, trust us. Just come on, we are so close. We are so close, close to doing right by all the work. That's all I can say, that's all I can say. And whether you vote for it or not, I'm gonna do this work. I wanna, I wanna, say something and one of the things I, I think is very important to realize here is the fact that when we do this work and you still have people that say we are not being seen and heard it's a problem that is a problem when we have people in our communities specifically our, our black brown disenfranchised communities that constantly speak about police interactions, not feeling seen or heard, not being able to record the things that are happening to them pertaining to uh, the anonymous interactions, that's a problem. When we look at 
different pieces of, of all of this work that we're working to do and the fact that I've been in office a little over three years now and I still bring this example up because it's fact. Spring Lake Division is working on their eighth major, seventh or eighth major since I've been in office for three years. That's a problem. That's a problem because as we heard, we can't wait. These conversations pertaining to oversight or just neighborhood policing in these same areas, when you have disarray in those types of conversations or community, that instability of, of that structure incorporated with communities that are hurting in asking to be seen and heard in different aspects as well as protected and served at the same time, you're going to have issues. You're going to have these types of situations where community does not trust what's happening as far as the process is concerned. You're gonna have uh, the situations where police are just saying, I'm just going in here to do my job and go home and not have that connection. You're gonna have young people who say, I don't care about the police. I don't want to be a police officer. I'm just trying to survive. You're going to have officers that are going to be in these communities that, again, are looking at these folks, ready to pull them over, ready to have that interaction to find out, oh, this is so-and-so, whatever the case may be, take them to jail and or uh, give them a citation, whatever the case may be. These are the conversations that I have to hear constantly. And there is no resolve for the people that I'm serving. And that's the unfortunate part, because there can be. And I look at this in so many different ways. And the reason I have to look at this in so many different ways is because I come from this community where we had an officer that was predatory on women that look like me and scared to tell their story because they wouldn't be believed. And he was intentionally going after those types of women because of their background. I am those women because I live down the street from where half of these incidents occurred. I am also looking at this from a lens of how we look at protecting even the officers that look like me that protect and serve our communities too. It's difficult for them to do this work, being officers of color. I can't even imagine. And I've heard some of the stories because their outlet is sometimes not as supportive as they would like for it to be. And we understand in different ways there could be some resolve for that. We have to be committed to the process of that. So that's why I say I look at it in a lot of different ways of how we effectively and efficiently protect and serve people who say they are not. We look at also, again, the fact that the people that came to this task force are of all different backgrounds, different political backgrounds, different atmospheres. And some of us are not as used to seeing police as others are. I see them all the time. I just talked about an incident that happened on uh, Martin Luther King Day for I had so many calls because I immediately called the city manager because I can't talk to the chief. I called the city manager and asked, what's going on? I need, what, please help me figure this out. Because people are saying the street is being shut down. Well, we figured out what was actually happening, but even in that instance, I drove down the street just to see for myself and understand what was going on because I had to look at it in all different ways. And to find 
that the police were sitting in their cars. The officers were talking to each other. I personally didn't see an officer get out and talk to anyone. And to me, that was a very missed opportunity for us to have those types of conversations. I also have to look at this in the lens of even the folks that were on the task force doing this work that are from these communities also saying, nothing's gonna be done. When is this gonna be over? Because we already know nothing's, we're still going to face the same trauma that we've been facing for decades. And that is unfortunate because we spent a lot of money for this work, for these words to be put on paper. We're about to spend a lot more money for the implementation of more work in these things to be done. So when we look at things that are working well, we know there are great things that are working well. Uh, let me say, when we talk about the FACT program in Northeast Oklahoma City, that relationship builder has created wonders for the community. When you go, and people just show up to see and look at officers from that community in particular that look like them. It means something to that community. It means something to me to see those officers invested in those young people and just the community in general. When we look at the program as far as the SROs, one of the things that I found out as we were going through this process, I had to find out last year from a whole different meeting with OKCPS that the work was being done pertaining to SROs because it wasn't told to us what was happening. I had to find that out from, from, a, from just the meeting in general about what's happening and how they're taking care of, of their student population. So that's the unfortunate part too, of, again, this disconnect. We have to be transparent about what's happening. We have to talk about what's happening. We still have to talk about the pros and cons of what is taking place in our communities. And as long as I'm serving those folks, and it's, I'm, I'm caught in a, a, a really tough circumstance because I understand the decisions that I make from this horseshoe are immediately going to impact the people that I serve and how they are going to be policed, how that neighborhood policing can be better or worse, or if there's going to be more over-policing of those same communities or less. We just heard about someone who couldn't even get in their driveway because they took ownership of the situation as far as communicating to this young man that we're doing our job and he couldn't get to his house. These are the small things, and that's not even small, constant things that are continuing to occur and take place. And for people to say that the doors are open for our police chief, I still have plenty of people in the community that say they cannot have a conversation with him. That's a problem if we're working to resolve conflict and have resolution on all aspects. Because we always have to agree to disagree. And as we're working through this, we're agreeing to disagree about a lot of these different recommendations. But there's still a way for us to work together to make sure all of these things take place. So what I would like to see, and, and, and again, to say we encourage the type of, of uh, folks to be a part of the police force and then going to the last 143 recruit class and, and hearing the guest speaker speak about the things that he said, it was, it was very discouraging for me to, to see the unbiased in that conversation for these new recruits when we're asking them to protect and serve, to not look at those things, to do this work unbiased. But a speaker is basically biased in what they're selling, saying to these, to these recruits. So we can do better 
I encourage us, and I know we can. So my question is, just as everyone else's that we've heard, when we get to this next, next part of the amendment number one to professional services, how soon will we see some type of movement pertaining to the receiving of these recommendations? That's my, my ask. Yeah, we're gonna to work together to get recommendation, get an implementation plan and start working on developing a plan for those that we start to work on first, those recommendations we start to work on first and bring them forward. We won't be able to do all of them at the same time, but we'll start to work on that as soon as we possibly can. Well, I'm, my, my ask and my encouragement is on our OKC.gov law enforcement task force page that we are continuing to con keep our community updated. Absolutely. Whether that be the application process of opening that, um, uh, understanding when the work for Ms. Martin will take place, and also for the things that we just heard, those 42 things that are being implemented right now, let's put them on there. Sure. Let, let's compare what we have received to what is being done so all of us understand how this is supposed to work together for the common good of all of our community, not just some. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on these items? Well, I certainly want to thank the Law Enforcement Policy Task Force members, the community policing working group members, the council who served on the task force, M.T. Berry, uh, the city manager, Kenny Soodle, uh, the chief and, and all of your staff and all of the various, uh, there were a lot of city staff from, from all kinds of departments I know that were involved in this. And I know this is just the beginning, but thank you so much for, for all of your work over these last 18 months. Okay, these items will be voted on with the consent docket and we still have a presentation on item BO. So we'll now advance to that. Brent Bryant, our finance director is gonna give a presentation here. Teresa was here. Uh, the chairman of the MAPS 4 Trust, as well as the Investment and Operating Trust, and she had to leave for another uh, commitment that she had. She gave it three hours. I mean, she did. She hung in there as long as she possibly could. But I appreciate her being here for the meeting uh, to be able to give this. Uh, Brent's going to just give a quick update on what we're doing here and the actions that were set forward actually in the resolution of intent. Yes. Okay. Good morning, Brent Bryant, uh, Finance Director. Uh, wanted to talk to you just briefly. Uh, the Ogmiot Trust was approved, was created, the Oklahoma City Maps Investment Operating Trust was approved by this council on March 16th of 2021. The purpose of developing a, a funding plan to take the $110 million from, out of the MAPS-4 program to support future operations and capital maintenance of, of certain projects. Today before you, the Ogmiot Trust had their first meeting in September of 2021, and then last week, on, or on, on February 21st, we approved our first uh, investment policy, which is the key thing on how we're going to invest these funds. Uh, we're going to invest these funds in domestic equity, primarily uh, about half international equity, around 6 or 7%, fixed income or bonds, around 28% to 33%, a little bit of real estate, some cash and then some alternatives. So the bulk of it is gonna be a little different than what you would normally see with a uh, retirement system where normally your equities would be in the 65 to 70% range uh, when you're doing a pension type fund, but this is just gonna be a little bit lower. And we, we did that primarily because the environment that we're going into. And one of the things that we are so, one of our main purposes is to protect the corpus of the funds. And so um, as you'll recall back when council created this, the idea was that this fund would go out and generate about seven, six, seven percent return annually, and we take four, that four percent of that six and use that for operations on an annual or, or for a maintenance purposes going forward. And so, what you have for you today, um, the uh, advisory board, the MAPS advisory board, on February 9th um, passed a resolution recommending uh, this today, this eighty million dollar transfer, which is thirty million dollars for youth centers. 30, 15 million for uh, senior wellness centers, uh, 21 million for the innovation district and the foster uh, foster project, the Freedom Center in the Clara Looper at $9 million and the beautification of $5 million. And so 
But with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. And then, uh, Councilwoman Hammond, you wanted to speak to BT? Yes. Um, I was mostly curious to hear, I don't know if um, the fire chief is available, but um, is this like a study that happens often? Is this just sort of, or is this newly sort of being um, sought out for specific reasons related to, I yeah, I'll, assume I'll, I know the chief gone. is here, was here earlier, and I don't know if he's still around, but I'll go ahead and just answer what I know on this. Basically, we do this periodically to look to see, you know, as the, as the city's growing and changing, what areas that we need to serve, or the areas where maybe we're having trouble with response times. And so they do this evaluation, particularly with the idea of coming into the next bond program to make sure that we've really got a good study that's been provided for us that uh, gives us a way to approach strategically where we need stations. And sometimes it could be a situation to relocate a particular station. Generally, it's as you grow and need to add stations, it's evaluating where those stations would be located. Okay, that's what I assumed. Yeah. It's good to hear more about it. Oh, um, here's Chief. Well, and I, I think we're good. I appreciate okay. you dashing in. but. Um, because I think this goes back to the conversation we had a few meetings ago about annexation and about our growth patterns, because to me, this feels like it's gonna be a self-fulfilling prophecy of like, surprise, we need a new fire station out in these areas of the city that um, don't maybe have great service because they, it's, suburb, it's sprawl, it's rural, um, and we've, or it's, it should be rural, I should say, but um, we've, created too much density there. Um, and so I'm also kind of curious to know and maybe get some updates when this is um, finalized about how could this actually inform us making better development decisions um, as a city? Because it, like I mentioned, you know, that cost analysis in, in our annexation studies, um, I'm curious to see how that actually plays out in real dollars when we start to say, instead of saying maybe this should inform our development conversations, that we just say, well, we need another fire station um, and what that cost actually ends up being. So I just kind of wanted to get a little more sense of, um, yeah, what, what information we're trying to get, but also if, if we can get an update when that um, study is done, that would be great. Okay. Okay. All right, that's all we had on the consent docket. If we wanna take a motion now. Mayor. Yes. Sorry, can we go ahead and actually pull out BB and BC to be voted on separately? Okay. So you wanna vote on BB and BC separately. And since they were voting on them all as a group, I assume we could just vote on those two as a pair since they are in tandem, like vote a motion, someone can make a motion to adopt those two items. Any objection to that? If that were the case, I mean, yeah. that's up to the council, sure. but I just wanted to introduce that possibility. Okay, so somebody would like to make a motion to... Um, what if you're gonna vote on one on one way and another on another? So oh, well, then, 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 we'll, then we'll separate them out. I wouldn't have imagined that was possible, but it could be, so. <laughs> all right, uh, all right, so then does somebody wanna make a motion on BB? And I guess you could just do it virtually. This is, we've pulled out BB for separate vote. So this is on the receive recommendations related to the task force and the working group. I'm voting to receive this. Okay. That's right, just receive okay. this. Got it. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes eight to one. Um, and then we have item BC, which is the amendment number one, the professional services agreement with 21CP solutions. Does somebody want to make a motion on that? A motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes eight to one. Okay, and then we still have the remainder of the consent docket, if someone wants to make a motion on that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
Okay, now we are at the concurrence docket. We have items A through K we could take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, now we are at item 11, items requiring separate votes. And, and I'll just say in advance, we've only had people sign up on a couple of items, uh, and I'll say that uh, in advance when it comes up. So 11A, ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 2800 North Cimarron Road from AA to I-1, Councilwoman Young. Thank you, Mayor. Let's see, the recommendation from planning was uh, that the ordinance be adopted. There were no protests, so I'll move for approval. A motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And I'm just going to step out for a few minutes uh, during the zoning docket to handle something and uh, turning it over to uh, Vice Mayor Stonecipher. Let's now move to item 11B, which is in Ward 2, please. And I heard you say there's no one signed up to speak, just making sure. Okay. Uh, then I would move for approval on this one. I will move for approval. It passes. We'll now move to item 11C, which is an ordinance on final hearing in Ward 7. Thank you. This is an ordinance on final hearing uh, recommended for approval for PC 10788 uh, going from R1 to AA. And I do understand um, there were no protesters for this conversation and there has no one has signed up to speak. So I will move for approval. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? There is. Please cast your vote. Item 11C passes. We'll now move on to 11D, which is another ordinance on final, ho final hearing from, again, Ward it's, 7. I think D is deferred. Oh, is it deferred? Okay. I'm sorry. Vice Mayor. Yes. May, may I make a request, uh, just not knowing how long all of these will require, sure. could we pro possibly move up items L and... Uh, what, you, wanted, you mentioned G. G, yes, uh -huh. G and L, just to ensure that I can okay. be present. So, Mr. Vice Mayor, I'll need to recuse myself on item L. Okay, well, let's first take up We'll come back to E and F, but let's first take up item G, where you can make a motion for a deferral if that's what you want to do at this yes. time. Yes, and uh, is the applicant here? Thank you. Uh, I would like to visit, if we may, not here, but sometime between now and two weeks from today okay. to discuss one of the concerns that uh, planning had mentioned and we'll just visit further if that's all right with you so we'll defer it for uh, the next council meeting in two weeks yes uh amy could you let us know the oh the 15th yeah yes so just yes, call sir. your office and make an appointment uh I'll, we'll yes you'll reach out okay yeah yeah way. thank you thank you very much appreciate your time thank you and i'm sorry you had to set through all of this just to hear that we're going to delay it my my apologies thank you Okay, everyone, we're on item 11G, and there's going to be a motion to, de uh, to defer until May the 15th. March 15th. Oh, excuse me, March the 15th. Yes, okay. thank you. Motion and second. Please cast your votes. The deferral is granted. Now we're going to go out of order, and we're going to take item 11L, which is another Ward 5 matter. 
And uh, I'll turn it over to you, David. On, uh, this is an ordinance on final hearing. Yes, thank you very much. And again, thank you all the members of the council to allow this to uh, move forward. Uh, there are no uh, protests filed on this zoning request, and uh, I would, and it was approved unanimously. I would uh, make a motion to approve this. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. Item L passes. Thank you all very right. much. You're welcome. We will now go back to item 11E, which is another ordinance on final hearing, this time in Ward 4. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. And um, just so you'll know, Todd, we do have someone signed up to speak. Okay. You want to go ahead and call that person up and we'll listen to them first. Can, can you read the handwriting? Shauna Bray. Did I get that right? With the help of Joe Beth. Would you please state your name for the record and also your home address? Um, my name is Shauna Bray. I live at 3601 Southeast 104th in Oklahoma City, 73160. Thank you. Okay. Todd? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I live uh, right next to this property, and um, there is a land dispute that's um, under Cleveland County Court right now for uh, part of it. As for the zoning, I'm okay with the zoning. Um, I am concerned with the multiple, multiple family units, the R4. That's, that's the only thing I really am concerned about. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate Otherwise, it. I'm not. I'm not opposing really their rezoning. Just I do have a, um, a pending court case on that okay. particular land. If I could ask you a question, Mr. Counselor, if we change the uh, zoning, if so can they start any development on this while that is still under action in court? They can unless uh, the, the court issues some type of an order that says they can't. Okay. Unless there's some type of stay order. Right, okay. exactly. Um, so, of course, that's with the courts. And we're, we don't decide that here as this body. Right. What we talk about is the zoning is the zoning appropriate, whether you own it, someone else owns it. Uh, so we will go ahead and decide, decide the zoning piece of it today. But honestly, if it changes in the zoning and the court finds that it's your property, uh, you'll be in better shape <laughs> than you are today, if that makes any sense to you. Is that with the changed zoning? Oh, with the train change of zoning? Yeah, if the zoning does change, if this happens to pass, uh, the court finds out, hey, that's your land, the zoning will still follow it, which doesn't mean you have to build anything on it, but it means, hey, if you wanted to build something on it, the zoning's already done for you. Does that make sense? Okay, as, as long as uh, they can't have just to come start back and building. See us. Pardon me? You wouldn't have to come back and see us. I would? You would not. Oh, that's okay. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> you wouldn't have to sit in the hard bench for four and a half hours out there. But if, you, if it gets rezoned, I mean, that, you know, as long as they're not going to start building on that, on that piece of property, because it's fenced in with my land right now, so. Yeah, that will have to come through the courts and not through us. Okay. I, but they can go ahead and get rezoned, right? Because I'm okay. I'm okay with that. I'm just, I have concerns with the R4. That's okay. the only part of it I have concerns with. The rest of it looked really good. I had some of your same concerns on that. So, uh, Mr. Box, can you stand up? You want to talk to us about any changes you might want to make on this? I would, <laughs> Councilman. David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Uh, in track three, um, we discussed removing the multifamily residential 8200.12 use unit. So we would uh, agree to that change. Uh, within the, the MDS. And just to, to answer a question about timing, even if this gets approved, you know, nothing could happen until a preliminary plat came through, which is a, a lengthy process, which 
is a, a process that they will also get notice of as it goes through the Planning Commission. Okay, so, and thank you for that clarification. Yes, sir. But I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So, Tract 3. Yes, sir. We're removing the ability to have multifamily there. Yes, 8200.12 is the use unit we would uh, seek to delete. So, it would be a two, two separate motions need to be made. One, uh, amending the MDS to remove the 8200.12. Thanks, I'm just looking at the other tracks as well. Sure. You, you, there, there is not uh, multifamily in the other tracks. Correct. Track one's limited to the single family, track two is contemplated to be some form of office and, and uh, commercial and uh, and then track three allowed the multifamily as well as other uses. So our proposal would remove the ability to have uh, multifamily apartments. Okay. Does that address some of your concerns? Yeah. Does that address any of your concerns that you had there in regards to the multifamily? The apartment piece is out of it, so. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. All right, so. Entertain a motion at this time? Yeah, just make the motion. Okay, I need to make a motion to amend? Yes, to amend the master development, excuse me, master development plan to delete. 8212, 8200.12 on track three is my motion. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second, please cast your vote. Bradley. The motion passes. Now do we need a second vote? Yes. Okay. So I will uh, make a motion to approve the item as amended. <coughs> All right, is there a second? We have a motion to second. Please vote. Thank the, you. the amended motion passes. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 11F, which is in Ward 3, and this is also an ordinance on final hearing. Thank you, Vice Mayor. You're welcome. Um, while there were no protests at planning and the recommendation is that it be adopted, I did receive a couple of phone calls on this, uh, Mr. Fox, so I just want to mention that here today. Um, do we have anybody signed up to speak? We do not. Okay, thank you. In light of all of that, I'll move to approve. You've got a motion to approve. Could we have a second? Please vote. The motion passes. Item G was deferred. Uh, we will now move on to item H, which is in my ward. And uh, item H is a uh, rezoning to permit a mixed use development. Uh, it was approved by the Planning Commission on January 13th, 2022. There are no protests. So at this time, I will move for its approval. Please vote. The motion passes. We'll now move to item 11I, which is in Ward 4, and is again a rezoning uh, ordinance on final hearing. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Has anyone signed up to speak on this item? I, I do not have anyone signed up. No. Um, this is a, a 
zoning request uh, that basically is going to allow for a recreational vehicle park uh, next to, I believe it's a Loves out there, um, which I think actually is going to be a pretty good project. It's limited to 20 some odd spaces. Um, if anyone, if no one has any questions, I'd go ahead and recommend it for approval. We have a motion. Could we have a second? Got a second, please vote. The motion passes. We're on to item 11J, which is in Ward 1, and is again a rezone that's an ordinance on final hearing. Whoops. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I spoke with uh, the applicant this morning, and uh, as long as we go with the TEs and the conversation we had, I have no, no issues with this at all. We've had no, no one signed up to speak, correct? We do not. Okay, yeah, and we don't have any objections, so I move for approval. We have a motion. We have a second. Please vote. The motion passes. We'll now move on to page 14 of our agenda at item 11K, which is a rezone ordinance on final hearing in Ward 7. Yes, this is recommended for approval, and this is PUD 1875-12302 North Kelly. Um, I know there was a, no protest, but I believe we may have reviewed and resolved some other things that were happening in this development. So I will... Uh, move for the approval with the amended TEs for this application. We have a motion to approve. We now have a second, please vote. The motion passes. We've already heard item 11L, so we'll move on to item 11M, which is again a rezoning ordinance on final hearing in Ward 2, please. Yes, um, <clears throat> I've actually spoke uh, with the applicant via virtual conversation and I really appreciated their time and I would move for approval unless they're here, but I don't think they are. So let's do this. I don't think anybody else is here. I don't think so. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. <clears throat> the motion passes. We'll now move to item 11. In at page 14 of your agenda. This is in Ward 4, and again, it's an ordinance on final hearing for a rezone. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, this project is over off, it's around 44th and Shields area, and uh, it's multifamily. It's an infill project, and I would just recommend to the rest of the council that this is a good one to take a look at, to look at how infill can still appears somewhat part of the neighborhood. Uh, it has high density as well. It's, I think it's gonna be a fantastic, actually, project for the area. So, uh, no one has any questions, I'd certainly recommend it as approval. Great. Do you have any information Go to the back. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. The motion passes. We'll move on to item 11O, which is in Ward 1, and again is a rezone ordinance on final hearing. David, can we talk about this one a little bit? We have anybody signed up? We, okay. we do not. Uh, once again, David Box, 522 Call Core Drive. Uh, this is an application for on queue uh, along uh, basically Northwest Highway in Hefner. It will allow us to have signage, which we believe to be more appropriate for Northwest Highway and, and the, uh, the turnpike that's there. Um, it did come before Planning Commission and was recommended for approval uh, unanimously. And, and I would note, just for the record, that uh, Planning Commission member Janice Powers 
who does not like signs, is one of the eight people that voted for this application, okay, which, if you follow the Planning Commission, that is significant. <laughs> planning Commission meetings last about as long as City Council meetings. Well, now, they, so they we have know. been, yes. I move for approval on this. Thank you. All right, we're on item, oh. item N, right? Or O? O. O. All right. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, item P. This is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 2741 Northwest 36, going from SPD 349 to SPD 1369. Councilman Cooper. Yes, thank you. And this was another one where I, I think, do is the app. In person, we've only met virtually. Would you mind speaking to this and introducing yourself, please? Sure. I can. So good to see you. Hi, I'm Chiandra Johnson, 4101 Perimeter Center Drive. I represent the applicant here. Um, we're just asking for a rezoning to allow for a dispensary. And then there's also um, a request for a small farm winery, which just means that um, there's a restaurant there and they want to be able to serve um, spirits if allowed. Thank you. Kenny Jordan, um, do we need to add restaurant and food as an amendment to this? There was some confusion during our virtual yeah. meeting. Uh, Boyd gave me a note that reminder that we need to. Um, so I'm going to have to trust your guidance on that one. What are we trying to do? On this one? Yes. Um, Deandra, would you mind saying again? Sure. Yeah. There's a restaurant in there already, separately from what my client is trying to do. Um, but I guess what's on the existing spud is maybe bakery, deli, that's there. Retail grocery is also there. But I don't think restaurant specifically is there. JJ, uh, I don't know. What, what do they have in their uses do they have in their plan? This was kind of a strange mm -hmm. SPUD where they listed specific uses rather than use units from the zoning code mm -hmm. for some reason. I don't see restaurant, so I think we should add that. Uh, yeah. And the ability to serve alcohol would be permitted if yeah. a restaurant is permitted. Yeah. So, so you, uh, do, you need a, a motion. To yeah, I'd like to make a motion to amend with the allowance specifically for the restaurant food to this item. Do you have any further questions, Councilman? Okay. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? There's a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. The application is amended as stated. We're back on it now. And then the only other thing that I'd like to say about this before I move for approval is, and Deandra, please let me know if I'm speaking out of turn. I said in public I would reiterate some of the things we said in sure. a private conversation with the resident, Ms. Moon, who had reached out to us, um, who, um, and I think she, if she were here right now, would probably say hello to Coach Love, who they right. used to work with, a uh, teacher and coach together. Uh, and he's going to be one of the guys operating this, this venture. Um, the notes I took was for Ms. Moon and Coach Love to keep in contact regarding litter issues already coach love uh is tending to beautification efforts yeah. around the area and i just recommended that he and miss moon keep in contact her house being right behind where this venture is and to keep in contact any uh future uh crimes that might take place you know i'm someone who always tells people i cannot promise you utopia i don't believe that that's but what we can do is mitigate harm and we can make sure that that relationship is always there. So I'd ask that they keep in contact should anything ever happen. Um, and that Coach Love would provide appropriate security for his business, which he agreed to, already is planning to do. And then uh, finally, Ms. Moon noted some security camera concerns for one of the adjacent tenants. And Mr. Lee, who owns the overall property, agreed to them. Is that your understanding as yes. well? So those were the three things, uh, making sure they stay in contact regarding litter issues, any possible future uh, criminal behavior, 
um, in the area and uh, for him to provide that appropriate security for his business and then finally for Mr. Lee to speak to the tenant because there was a camera that was pointing toward some of the neighbor's backyards uh, from the business and Ms. Moon was very concerned about that. Yes. And so Mr. Lee, the property owner, said he would work to address that so we need to make sure that that happens. And um, if maybe you could update uh, my office when that does happen, that we would appreciate that. Can do. Thank you. Yeah, and can thank do. you just for being so kind and open and same, just really appreciate you and Coach Love during this process. No problem. And uh, same to Ms. Moon for reaching out to me and with that I would move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Item Q, ordinance on final hearing at, that was recommended for approval at 11120 Southwest 15th, going from AA to PUD 1703, Councilwoman Young. Thank you, Mayor. There were no protests at planning and it was recommended for adoption and everybody needs a doggy daycare close to their house, so I'm 100% for this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll move for approval. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. I go. No. No. <laughs> I would volunteer for that. Passes unanimously. All right, item R. This is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval. It's a special permit to operate a drinking establishment uh, in the CCBD Central Business District with the UD Urban Design Overlay District. Uh, at 400 Southwest 25th. Um, Councilman Stone, the applicant is here, but is merely available for questions. Yeah. I, I assume that's you? That's Robert? me. Okay. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing here? Yeah. Uh, I am Robert Gage Paps. This is Price Fisher. We're here on behalf of the renovation of the Oklahoma Opry in Capitol Hill. So there's going to be two phases in this, but this is for phase one. The old NAG station, formerly known as the NAG station, was the like concession bar. So we are um, requesting permission to convert that into a cocktail bar, coffee and cocktail. Uh, and then phase two is a year or two out and that involves the actual renovation of the theater, the historic Opry theater. So yeah, that's pretty much the gist of why we're here. Fantastic, sounds like a great project. If there's no questions on it, I will motion for its approval. Like a legit cocktail bar, not like the watered down nonsense, but actually like the real deal. We, we consider it legit, yeah. I, I'm legit. Godspeed you. <laughs> we'll be looking for that opening announcement. Yes. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, item S is a resolution receiving an amendment to the comprehensive plan, removing the urban future land use typology area layer from the urban low intensity base LUTA designation on an approximately 142 acre tract of land at the southwest corner of Northwest 150th and North Morgan Road. This was deferred, it's in Ward 8, and I understand we also have a presentation. Yes, uh, Jeff Butler, our planning director, will give us a quick update on this change. Uh, good afternoon, Jeff Butler, Planning Director. Um, just uh, briefly go through this and uh, inform the uh, council as to what, what's happening here. Um, this is, uh, as was mentioned, at 150th Street and Morgan Road. Um, this is an area of the city that has seen a lot of growth pressure, um, and it's uh, associated with a, P with a PUD that was uh, voted on earlier. Uh, so there it is in the in the uh, urban future area. Um, and it's surrounded by, um, uh, there, there is a, some development to the south. It's been there for uh, some, some time now. Um, and this is uh, going to be a new single family residential development. Uh, so currently uh, surrounded by a mixture of different zoning types, uh, mostly AA. Uh, and again, uh, this is uh, an area that's seeing a lot of development pressure. So it does have water and sewer available um, it's just right on the outside of, uh, 
of what is preferred uh, for fire response time. Um, and the Planning Commission did approve this request. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's just a brief summary. We just wanted to make you aware uh, this is to be received today. It was The action was taken by the Planning Commission. Yeah, that's my understanding. The Planning Commission approved it. We're only receiving it today. Correct, and yes. this is uh, a part of a deal that came before us earlier where a, an agreement was brokered with the HOA to the south uh, approving what's going to roll out in phases is, is the Habitat for Humanity homes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I'd move for the resolution's receipt. All right, we've got a motion in the resolution, item S. And a second. Cast your votes. Passes six to two. And then similarly, uh, item T is a resolution receiving an amendment to the comprehensive plan, removing the urban future land use typology area layer from the urban low intensity base looted designation on an approximately 40 acre tract of land at the northwest corner of Southeast 104th and South Bryant. Uh, this is in Ward 4, but I believe we also have a presentation here as well. Okay. Uh, again, Jeff Butler, Planning Director. So this, this case is on the far southeast uh, side of the city uh, next to Moore, and uh, also it was associated with a single family uh, zoning application. This one um, is a, it's, uh, it's also removing the urban future layer and uh, designating as, as urban low, um, as you see there. And then it, uh, it is surrounded as, as the previous one was by some undeveloped land and zoning that is uh, also AA. There is uh, a little bit of uh, development nearby, uh, most notably in Moore and a little bit to the north. Um, the difference here, it does have water and sewer that the developer will be extending. Uh, it is also in the area where we have uh, not ideal fire services just outside of, of our preferred uh, fire service standard. However, we, we often have this case on the, on the boundary of the city where we really don't uh, there are these little pockets uh, that often don't have great fire service, but there's really not an opportunity to improve that uh, because it's right on the border. So um, that, that's sometimes a difficult situation. Uh, the Planning Commission did approve this one as well on January 13th. Uh, I did want to mention uh, the council was sent an email. These types of cases from now on will go to the consent docket, and it'll just go right after the Planning Commission um, uh, hears and decides on on these cases. So uh, that'll be done and you can see that before uh, the case comes to uh, the, the associated zoning case comes forward. So just wanted to make you all aware of that. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to receive. Okay. We have a motion and a second on the resolution. Cast your votes. Passes six to one. All right, now we're at item U. This is an ordinance on final hearing, changing the two hour time limited parking to 15 minute time limited parking on the north side of Northwest 7th. Uh, near Hudson. It's in Ward 6, but Councilwoman Hammond has stepped out. Um, I don't suppose she asked anybody to make a motion, but... Um, I, can, I can make a motion. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11... V is an ordinance on final hearing establishing 45 degree angle on street parking on the north side of Northwest 9th uh, from approximately 40 feet east, et cetera, et cetera, near Dewey uh, and Walker. So it's also in Ward 6. Somebody wants to jump I'll in. I'll make a motion. Councilwoman Hammond, we are on some traffic cases in your ward. We were just taking a motion on 11V. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And now we are at 11W. This is an ordinance on final hearing establishing reserve parking for the physically disabled on the north side of Northwest 9th uh, near Dewey. Councilwoman Hammond. I will move for approval. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, item 11X. This is an ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing on March 15th, final adoption March 29th. Um, this is redistricting, uh, changing and describing the ward lines of the city of Oklahoma City pursuant to various legal requirements that we do such every decade at least. And I believe we have a presentation. Yes, so Kenny Sudel, Assistant City Manager, is gonna provide a presentation. I do wanna acknowledge, and I think he probably will in his presentation too, we just had a number of employees who've participated in this and worked through this process and helped lead us through this, participated in engagement processes, and I appreciate Kenny's leadership, municipal counselor's office, and their guidance and work on this. Um, it's been a team effort all the way, and um, I really appreciate the work that they've done um, to make sure that we could bring something forward to the council uh, for you to adopt. Kenny? So, Kenny Sudel, assistant city manager, just to give you a quick update. So, <clears throat> just a reminder on the process, we got our census data in September of 2021, the official release. Council passed a resolution in September of 2021 that set out the process. So this is the, the last piece of that process. Um, just to remind you, staff then loaded that census data into the current ward maps, and as part of our charter requirement, we determined that yes, redistricting was required, that the districts were, uh, the wards were unbalanced. So a draft map was created and provided to the council and public. Just to kind of give you a little bit of uh, insight into the process of, of public input. So there was a virtual town hall that we hosted on January 24th. Um, I know we also did some other outreach with some of you all. I know Councilwoman Nice, we came to your town hall and spoke about this as well. Um, we had an in-person Q&A session at the fairgrounds on January 27th, and then we had our okc.gov slash redistricting, had information, a web form. We also had the uh, email address you see on the screen where we received comments. So those comments and input from the public were received and reviewed, and we um, provided that to you all. It was our recommendation after those comments that we don't make any changes to the map. And so the next step that was laid out in the council resolution was to develop the ordinance, and that's what we have before you today in item X. And so that ordinance is uh, introduced today with a uh, public hearing scheduled on March 15th, and then uh, a final hearing scheduled for March uh, 29th. Um, just a couple quick facts. So again, to remind everybody that the new 2020 population uh, is 681,054. So if you divide that by eight, the average ward population is 85,132. So after we, we put the proposed ward map up, our wards range anywhere from 83,738 to 86,824. And I just want to remind everyone the council resolution in September established that we could go plus or minus 2% from that average ward population. So the wards are within that range. And then finally, this is just a picture of the map. So again, I think many have seen this um, and be happy to take any questions at this point. Um, did I hear you correct? Well, first, thank you everyone who's done this work. It seems uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, second, we had received uh, as council members public comment notes. Mm -hmm. And so did I just hear you correctly say that even with those notes, there's, you're not recommending any changes? That's correct. Okay. A follow-up, and I didn't see it in those notes, but I know it's an email I forwarded to you uh, from the uh, Windsor District. They have expressed mm -hmm. concerns, as you know, mm -hmm. about uh, representatives who live in, uh, I believe it's Musgrave Pennington, which has traditionally been Ward 3, mm -hmm. um, but that they are the leadership of the Windsor District but so much now of the Windsor District is is right there in Ward 2, and so they had asked us to, to revisit that. What's that look like? 
Yeah, we, we did take a look at that, Councilman. Um, that little area is, is a difficult area. You've got a neighborhood that goes between 23rd and 16th, and then right next to it, you've got one that goes from 19th to 10th, and then right next to that, I think you've got one that goes from 16th maybe to 23rd. I'm, I'm probably misstating that, but that's why there's a little bit of a stair step there. We did take a look at if we could move Musgrave Pennington potentially from three to two. There are about just under 3,000 um, residents in that area. Um, I think I think it's, you know this better than me, I think, and I'm going from memory, so I think it's, from, isn't it from Meridian, Portland, 23rd, and 16th? That area has a little under 3,000. We looked at it to see if we could do that, and it puts us outside of the limits. We actually also looked at if we could do that and, you know, look, are there other little places that we could change, and we just couldn't really find a good option to do that. We also looked at the reverse. Could we move some of the other areas, like the Windsor areas, into three so that they're all together, and that was an even more difficult. There were more people in that one. So unfortunately, it was one of those that just we looked at and couldn't find a way to make, make the math work in that area without making wholesale changes to other places in the ward map. I think when we talked about it, because we talked about it in the process early on, trying to keep first Windsor Pen uh, Musgrave Pennington together because the first rendition had them split up a little bit and then trying to figure out a way to keep all of that together without creating a similar situation in other places. So, Yeah, you're exactly right. The, the very first draft had it split along, I believe, 19th Street, and the, the, we came back based on some <clears throat> comments from both Councilwoman Young and Councilman Cooper and, and put that back together. So I think the concerns that I heard in that email was just about coordinating also with the various council members who will represent the Windsor District and that that hasn't always been easy. <laughs> it's a good word. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so I would just say from the horseshoe today, both to staff and to Ward 3 and Ward 6, and I know Councilwoman Hammond and I have already attended, I think it was right before you won, I can't remember, um, but we've already attended a, a Windsor District uh, meeting with them, so I just, it's gonna take the three of us working together, um, especially because MAPS 4 dedicates funding to uh, the Windsor District and better connecting it to the urban core as well as it should be. Uh, so we're just gonna have to work together uh, with those residents over there. That's, I think it's critical, so. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Okay, well then today's task would be to introduce it. If the council wants to make a motion. Got a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This will have a public hearing on March 15th and potential final hearing on March 29th. Okay, we are now at item 11Y1. This is the public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures here listed and we've had a couple of folks sign up to speak. So let me go ahead and bring forward um, Izell Kendrick. Izell, you're here to speak on item B on this list at 3715 North Phillips and also item uh, H, 743 Northeast 36. Yes, and they're also um, on the 11AA. On they the, will show uh, abandoned oh, structures as well. They will show up again. You're saying and on abandoned. Okay, abandoned, got abandoned that. Numbers, we'll yeah. cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. So, um, I came from California to address this issue. Mm. Um, my father passed away last year, and he, you know, occupied those properties. The seven, the three, 3715 is right behind the 743. Mm -hmm. So they're right behind each other. So last year when he passed away, I came and. It was a mess. I mean, it was way more unsightly than it is today. So I had bins brought in, four cubic yard bins. I filled up four of those. And so tried to make it as nice as possible with the intention of eventually tearing the thing down, tearing everything down, and hopefully, um, not hopefully, but my plan is to put um, 
elder housing there. That's my dream for my father because he was a pillar in that community. Everyone knew him. Everyone stopped by there. He's been there. He was there for 50 years. Um, and so I'm, I have crews there now. We're getting ready to you know, clean up. But the problem, the ongoing problem is people dumping tires and dumping trash. So I tore down the fencing to make it open because I was afraid of the homeless situation, to make it open so the neighbors could see because the neighbors call and let me know what's going on. And my big concern was noting the uh, abandoning issue that there's a month time frame listed on this paperwork to have something torn down. Well, I travel extensively. If the neighbors hadn't called me and told me that the city was there, this would have been done without my knowledge because sometimes I'm gone for months at a time and I'm not able to retrieve my mail. But I was at home and so I said, I'm planning a trip to come and address this issue. So I spoke with the um, code enforcement and so we're working together to get all this done. I'm gonna tear down some structures and then fix up you know, what needs to be fixed to bring it back into acceptance for code enforcement. But my big concern was um, not having the um, enough time frame you know, to handle some of these issues, considering that I'm out of state. But I just want the city council to know I'm working on it, and it's going to be done. I'm staying here for the next two weeks with the crews to try to get this done and get this stuff situated. Um, but I wanted you guys to be aware of the ongoing problem of trash dumping and tires over and over and over and over again. This continues, so I'm constantly calling out people to pick up stuff and haul stuff away, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I was trying to give myself time to, I've had major surgery the last year, so a lot of this stuff of tearing down and stuff, I wasn't, I had back surgery, so I wasn't able to come here and deal with it. But I'm here now, and so we're gonna address it this week. So I just wanted to voice my concerns, sure. just really about the time frame and just the ongoing issue of trash dumping in that, in that community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Nice. Yes, um, I actually spoke with Mr. Kendricks this morning uh, about, the issue that is happening and he explained to me the work that he's also doing so I will ask um, that we defer and I also want to make mention to to the point I know we have dumping everywhere but unfortunately it happens more often in Northeast Oklahoma City than it should and uh, with that the responsibility is always the ownership of those who are most of the time, not to say all are, but most of the time are at a disadvantage in being able to have that cleared in a certain time frame. Um, and it's without, you know, out of their control, uh, clearly when these things occur. So that's the unfortunate part of, of even these things when they, when they take place. So I will ask that we defer the item B as well as item H for Mr. Kendricks for two weeks. Okay. I think we can do those together with one motion. So the motion is to defer item 11Y1, B, and 11Y1, H, two weeks. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Before we leave 11Z, may I ask, ask staff a question? Uh, we're on 11Y. Is that? Oh, and yes, of course. I'm you sorry. <laughs> um, Never mind. Okay, but you you are not on. You're not out of a question on this vote, correct? Yeah. So we can close it if everybody's voting. Sure. I'm sorry. My oh, yeah, fault. No uh, Councilman Cooper, I guess we're waiting. Have you voted? No, we're over here. Okay. How would you like to wish? How would, how would you wish to vote? <laughs> <laughs> Long day. <laughs> okay. All right. Passes unanimously. Items are deferred. Um, we're still on here because we have another resident who signed up to speak, uh, and this is in relation to item Y1E, and that is Robert Phillips and nephew Mike Chapel. Good evening, Mayor, City Manager, and Council. Um, Nikki Nice, as well as the other Council members. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to come and speak again. 
uh, in reference to what we were asked to do by his counsel. Uh, Ms. Nice was to give a progress report. We'd like to publicly apologize as there was delays in getting those into her on a weekly basis. However, since our last presence uh, to address the uh, unsecured building, uh, what you see before you are some concrete uh, barriers that we've put up. However, the building has been occasionally penetrated again by vagrants. Uh, we've had them moved out. Um, and so again, we, we, we're making progress. Uh, the interior has been cleaned out. We uh, uh, removed about 10 loads uh, of debris that was inside of the facility. Um, since the last council meeting, we've made progress and uh, brought on an, a uh, structural engineer uh, who just prepared us the uh, final report this morning. Uh, the report has proven that the building is structurally sound with, uh, with, uh, with the exceptions of the deck uh, that is on the facility. Uh, the deck and the roofing would need to be replaced. Uh, that capital is pretty extensive, but neither here nor there. Uh, we've made progress and we respectfully ask to continue to make progress. Uh, also, we uh, have a work order with uh, OG&E uh, as we speak, and it's just a matter of time of waiting for them to respond to provide us uh, lighting so we can uh, at least mitigate, hopefully, some of the vagrants and, and traffic that's been going on in that area with some lighting at the expense of the owner, Dr. Phillips. Um, we've received quotes on what it's going to take uh, to get the roof done, but. Uh, I would not stand here before you and tell you that that would happen in 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. Um, I just know we have quotes, but we can definitely uh, secure that building um, in a fashion that is going to be acceptable uh, by the city um, and probably can make that happen here, hopefully within the next 24 or 36 hours uh, to secure the, the facility itself. I guess my, my question to Mr. Chad Davidson, um, pertaining to this property, and I understand we're looking at the security of, of this structure. Um, um, I'm just trying to figure out what, what the right question would be in order for us to, to get immediate attention. What does that look like for them? Because uh, clearly, we understand this is an important piece of our history and to the progress of preservation, we have seen the work that has been done thus far. We understand also, as I just forementioned in the last uh, conversation about the dumping and folks who are just vacating properties that don't belong to them, and also in the weight of the og and &E response, and I'm, I'm hoping even with our influence as far as the city is concerned, for those conversations to, to happen uh, in a way that we can also support in whatever way we can for this to be expedited uh, as soon as we can for these situations to not occur, um, if we can prevent them from occurring, or at least not as frequently as they've been occurring. So I don't know, that was a pretty loaded question, so take it as you choose. Okay, so uh, Chad Davidson, Code Enforcement Superintendent, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Phillips again this morning. Um, and we kind of talked about a, a couple different things. Uh, we've got a dilapidated case here on the building as well as an unsecured. So first and foremost with the dilapidated portion, you know, it really needs a roof. Uh, that's the portion that, that, that needs to happen. Um, I understand in, in the, in, that they've got an engineer's report. Uh, I know he's going to get that to us uh, as soon as possible. We tried to email it today. File wouldn't, was a little too large to get to me. So we'll definitely look at that and then help in any way we can to facilitate permits to get help them get that roof on there. As for the the securing of the building, by moving those blocks there, and we've talked about this this morning, and I think they were in agreement, um, it left smaller openings, and I'm really concerned with people getting inside there 
and if there's an emergency that needs to happen, getting help to those people. So that, that's really important. I think they've agreed that, that um, they, can, they can probably take care of that in 48 hours, right? Isn't that what you That is correct. Yeah, 24, 48 hours or so. So I think the theory is, uh, I know we discussed maybe doing some masonry type work, getting some cinder block, covering some of those openings up. That way it'll keep people completely out of there and then maybe having a place where they can enter by door. So uh, I think that'll help out tremendously. Okay. Um, what, what, I'm, what I would like to do is, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Phillips, and, and to you, uh, Reverend Chapel, for being here to continuously keep us updated on the progress and the process of what is happening. Um, what I would like to do is let's, if you don't mind, I, my concern also is safety. I think all of us are, are concerned about the safety of the structure as far as people getting in and if something should happen. Uh, we want to make sure everyone remains on the safe side of whatever takes place. So I'm hoping that within two weeks we can, if we can get it off the unsecured list, that's my goal, at least right now. I know we need to get it off of the dilapidated list, but I would hope that we can get it secured first. And that's un where we've been incrementally working towards. So I'm going to ask for us to look at another couple weeks and we're going to continue to stay updated in, in whatever ways we can for that process and, and work towards that. And, and by then, you'll be able to see their report that they have and I'm sure they'll have a plan in place and maybe this, this um, conversation will work through itself for us to, to work through the next the next step to get this off of all of our lists so we can, y'all can start, keep working instead of having to come up here. That's what my goal is for this. So I'm gonna ask that we defer this for a couple more weeks if you don't mind. Actually, let's just make it to the end of the month. I know we have three meetings this month. So let's just go ahead and continue that through the end of this month and, and then um, that will give us plenty of time. But I. I I do ask that we work towards the security of this building ASAP, please. So this would be a deferral to the March 29th meeting. That's correct. For item uh, Y1E. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Um, and I know for both gentlemen, we, we got, we'll handle this again, I think, probably in a few minutes on some of these other dockets, but we're not quite there yet. So uh, nobody else has signed up to speak under the public hearing on dilapidated structures. I do have something, if you yeah. don't mind, because mm -hmm. um, I just wanna, want to make mention because of all of these structures that are on dilapidated, um, 11 of them, if I'm not mistaken, of the 13 belong to Ward 7, which is very alarming to me to see that many uh, structures. So I would like for us to get a report of the past year for 2021, dilapidated structures for each and every ward. Also, uh, specifically to these areas, I know there are some concentrated areas that we have code enforcement right now. I would like for us uh, a report of those particular uh, areas specifically that we have uh, concentrated code enforcement for 2021 in comparison to other wards of those same dilapidated structures. And um, again, while I understand we have, you know, we have concerns all over the city, to me, this, this does not look good for us to look at how this is concentrated right now and most of the time uh, Ward 7, for to see 11 of, of these 13 is very disturbing. And um, for us to have these conversations and, and just transparency for folks to already believe, 
not to say it's true, but already believe that their homes are being taken uh, from our city or by our city. I, I think we can do better in these instances. And also it shows why it is important for us to have the programs that we have, the revitalization and et cetera programs for these same communities. But we have to concentrate our efforts as well in these communities to make sure that they are not on these same lists. So uh, that is my ask in this, because I, when I saw this list on Friday, I was not pleased and, and immediately um, very dis, just wondering what is happening. And to the point of the fact that, not to say all of these are from out of town folks, um, we do have a family member that was committed to coming back to home and, and caring for that property. But we have a lot of these investment groups and different people that own these properties that do not care. And that also uh, is disappointing and brings down the morale and property value for our community. So those were my two asks, and I hope we can get that information for us to look at how uh, this process has um, been implemented and impacting certain wards. Thank you. Okay, any other items on regarding these dilapidated structures? And Mark, you wanted to talk about when we get to item Z, right? The unsecured, okay. All right, hearing none, well then we'll take up the resolution found at Y2 declaring that the structures are dilapidated except for those previously deferred and struck. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. For some reason I can't vote. How do you wish to vote? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, now we're on 11Z. This is the Z1 is the public hearing regarding the unsecured structures here listed except for those previously struck, and I see that item M is one we just deferred, so we probably want to do that again. Yes, let's, if you don't mind, I would like to defer that to March 29th. Okay. Thank you. Got a motion and a second to defer that item 11Z1M to March 29th. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Um, I don't believe that Mr. Kendrick's items are on this list, uh, and I don't see that anyone else has signed up to speak. Uh, Mark, what did you want to talk about regarding yeah. item Z? Chad, item 11ZI. I mm -hmm. drove by that. Um, it looks like it's a uh, remodel, a construction project. Can, can we uh, check on that one? I could be wrong. That's not it. That's another house. Okay, never mind. Thank you. Okay. okay. Then, uh, hearing no other comments, we could look at the resolution found at 11Z2 declaring that the stru structures are unsecured except for those struck or deferred. Is there, uh, are we able to spinning? Fashion way. <laughs> All right, is there a verbal motion to adopt uh, 11Z2? So moved. And a second? All right, I've got a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Carter? Aye. Councilperson Cooper? Aye. Councilperson Young? Aye. Councilperson Stone? Aye. Councilperson Hammond? Aye. Councilperson Nice? Aye. Councilperson Stone Cipher? Yes, please. And Mayor Holt? Aye. 
Motion carries unanimously. Now we're on to 11 AA1. This is the public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed. And we do have item F here that would appear to line up with one we previously deferred. Councilwoman Nice? Yes, I'd like to defer for two weeks. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. <clears throat> this is deferring item 11A1F for two weeks and it passes unanimously. Uh, no one else has signed up to speak under this public hearing, so we'll advance to 11AA2, the resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? There's a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 11AB was previously deferred, which brings us to 11AC1. This is a resolution approving the request for salary continuation for Major Jay Snow. While he continues to require rehab, uh, executive session is not requested. Got a motion and a second to adopt the resolution. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11 AD1 is a resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of Kayla Robertson v. City of OKC. Uh, executive session is not requested. Got a motion and a second to adopt the resolution. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 11 AE is uh, at item one, claims recommended for denial. There's items A through D we could take with one motion. Executive session has not been requested. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously, 11 AF, one claims recommended for approval. Items A through F can be Adopted with one motion, executive session is not requested. There's a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, we're now at item 12, comments from council. Uh, board one, board two. No, thank you. Board three. I just need to remind citizens that we've got a community meeting tomorrow night at the chapel at uh, Mid-America Christian University regarding SUP 550, which will be heard at the next council meeting on the 15th. And just a quick um, shout out to the former commissioner, Mary Coffey, on the planning commission, um, whose last day on the commission was last week. And we thank her for her service to our community over these last almost 10 years. Um, that she served on the Planning Commission and just thank her for the efforts. That's all I got. Board four. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority has come out with their new plan uh, and it includes a turnpike through much of Ward four. Uh, and there's a lot of people that are gonna be affected, myself included. And uh, I just wanted to let people know that I'm uh, digging for information, and as it becomes more readily available, uh, I will be holding a town hall meeting uh, in Ward 4 to discuss the future plans of OTA. So, thank you, Mary. That's it. Thank you. Ward 6. Yes, I'd like to just um, take a moment to recognize um, that the community lost a preservation um, champion last week and Catherine Montgomery passing away. Um, I know I can speak for myself and all my interactions with her that um, she's just always been um, so passionate about these landmarks that make Oklahoma City unique um, and the drive, of sort of selfless drive to um, contribute her talents um, where she could in a volunteer capacity to try to save buildings and then in her professional capacity um, to help, you know, redevelopment projects um, 
to put those buildings to use. So I know a lot of folks in the community are um, grieving her um, loss, and I just want to extend my um, condolences to anyone who is, um, yeah, who's grieving um, because we, I think, you know, it, it, as a community, we've lost someone really important and really impactful. And um, yeah, I think Councilman Nice and I have spoken about maybe trying to bring a resolution forward to commemorate and honor her work. Um, but I did want to just make a point to say something um, since we did lose her last week. Thank you. Ward 7. Yes, I just wanted to reiterate that, um, that that is a tremendous loss. And my first encounter with her was uh, in the efforts to save the Brockway Center. So had it not been for her and her efforts and the conversations we had to have with community and, and just engagement, um, those efforts would have been lost. So I, I, I'm speechless because of I did, I did not realize she had passed away. Um, so definitely want to honor her legacy. And today is the first, women, first day of Women's History Month. So I just want to honor all of the women that have served our, our city in this capacity. We've only had one female mayor. Um, and hopefully we'll have some more that will come through our city that will leave their mark. And for being the 10th, 11th and 12th woman, women, should I say, to serve our city council since 1890. It also shows we still have a ways to go. Um, and also for all of the women that serve our city, thank you for your work because um, we have wives, we have mothers, we have sisters, we have daughters. Um, and we have those who have been thrust in other capacities that they probably did not know they would be in, but they have made it work and also serve this city. So your efforts are not unnoticed. So thank you for every woman uh, that has been a part of making our city the city that we call home. I wanted to also mention um, uh, Black History Month. Of course, it ended on yesterday but it was commemorated with the Thunder game and they lost, I'm not gonna say again, but they lost, they did lose. But the winners, the winners were the young people. <laughs> the true winners were the young people for the Black History Month contest. We had ninth through 12th graders, so congratulations. We had a student from Southeast High School, a young, young lady from Lawton, we had a young lady from Oklahoma Christian Schools and a young lady from Edmond North High School. And I do want to send my gratitude to the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, for, uh, for asking me to be a part of the, the judging for this year. And it was so hard because we have so many talented young people in our city. And I just want you to realize as well of these four young ladies that ended up being all young ladies, it was a diverse group of young ladies. So um, they definitely uh, are to, to receive all of the gratitude for what they did. Um, Black History Month also want to thank Rogers Elementary School. I was able, they asked me to come speak to their sixth grade class yesterday. So I did go and I was very pleased to see just the male presence as far as teachers that they have. Uh, influencing our young minds at that school and being able to just talk about some of the things that are happening for them as far as history in that far northeast part that even a lot of them may not have realized and some of them may have but thankful that they were and also for ODOT um, the Department of Transportation it is located within the ward they also had a Black History Month program uh, I believe a week a week or a week and a half ago and um, was able to be a part of what they're doing and commemorating black history as well. And I also want to just say thank you to all of our, we had our Embark folks here. Thank you. I know they don't get thanked enough for what they do, but um, our thoughts are always with them as they continue to carry our community from here and there throughout our city. So I just wanted to leave with that, but um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a day, so. Thank you, Ward 8. I have a 1.30 MAPS meeting, so I have nothing to do. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. All right. We have no citizens who signed. 
What? I'm sorry, I forgot one very important <laughs> thing. I promise it will be super short, but Councilwoman Nice reminded me of it. Uh, Women in Construction Week nationwide is um, going to be celebrated next week by the National Association of Women in Construction. The Oklahoma City chapter is doing job site tours and events in the evenings. If you'd like more information, Ward 3 at OKC.gov. Thanks. Thank you. We have no citizens who signed up to speak and no other business. We are adjourned.